Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. I appreciate each and every single one of you. For those who might not know, my name is Jared. This is Guns and Gadgets. This is where you get Second Amendment news every single day. And today we'll be covering live the House Judiciary Committee oversight hearing on the ATF. Stephen Dettelbach, the director of the ATF, is on the carpet today. And he will be asked questions about the pistol brace rule, the frame and receiver rule, and the zero tolerance for FFLs, among other things. It's going to be good. It's going to be fun. Um, I can't wait to see what this guy lies about next. Before we get too far into it, I want to thank Blackout Coffee for making this live stream possible. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you very much. Blackoutcoffee.com slash GNG. Check us out. Hot chocolate tea, coffee, swag, cups, mugs, you name it, plus hats. Uh, for all those who have bought Blackout Coffee, thank you for supporting our company. I am part owner, if you don't know, and uh, can't wait to show you what's happening soon in the future. Uh, please like the video and share it while we can before this gets going. Uh, I'm going to check us out here. We're still waiting. Cool. Um, I just want you all to know how grateful I am that you allow me to do this every day. And uh, before we, I get too caught up in what's actually happening at this hearing, I want to thank you again, seriously, for supporting Guns and Gadgets and making this the premier source for Second Amendment news. Thank you all. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, hello to everybody in the comment section. My setup's a little different now. I've taken some stuff to Tennessee. I'm here uh, cleaning up for the last time here in Massachusetts. I see uh, uh, Gregory, thanks for saying it's great coffee. Appreciate you all. Where's everybody from? Let's get it going. See where we all are. See if we get all 50 states represented before we start the, uh, the craziness that is the ATF. Idaho says hello. Awesome. New York. <laughs> That's awesome. Well... Sorry, as a former Massachusetts resident, I get it. Oklahoma, Iowa, Virginia, Michigan, upper the the Uper of Michigan this year. North Carolina, Florida, Kentucky, Arizona. Uh, let's see, Tennessee, New Mexico, Colorado, Montana, North Carolina, South Carolina, Louisiana, Maryland. Looks like we have the whole country here. Pennsylvania, Washington State, Georgia, New Jersey. This is awesome. This is why I do this, guys and gals, because. We all need to know what's going on. California, Texas, Rhode Island, Connecticut. If we do not know what's going on, then we cannot prepare to defend it when it does show up because it will show up at your doorstep. It's not, uh, not if, but when. So I want to thank everybody for uh, joining and being a part of this. Um, waiting to hear some specific questions that are asked. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nod, nod. Um, it should be good. Uh, for all of, uh, all of you who have mentioned in the post, why would I cover this? Uh, the reason is because if you don't understand how your government works, how it truly works, then how would you make changes? How would you work within the parameters? Uh, and how could you push for something you want passed? Or how would you push back against something you don't want passed? That's why I do these, because I think it's imperative that we understand exactly how things work. This is an oversight hearing. Uh, oversight was something that's been missing direly in the last two years, the first two years of Joe Biden's administration. There wasn't a lot of oversight. Why? Because in the House, which has oversight, uh, they were previously controlled by Joe Biden's party, which means everything he did was okay. And now we're going to be putting some checks and balances on that stuff. So that's why I cover this. And hopefully you all agree. What we got here? Bill, thank you so much. Appreciate you. Um, we got Tim from Nebraska. We got Missouri, Indiana, Florida. This is awesome, guys. Tim, I sure hope this is not 15 hours. This is just a small hearing. I would I would venture to guess noon would be to, would be late, um, but we'll see. <laughs> I am prepared. I did bring some water. Um, hopefully, this doesn't go much longer than uh, than an hour or two. But then, Renbro, thank you. But we'll we'll see, man. Thank you all for being here. For everybody who was here during the 15-plus hour marathon, thank you. Uh, that was amazing. We raised a lot of money for a phenomenal cause just because we were all bored and not trying to stay stay active. So thank you. I appreciate it. Eugene, thank you so much. Good name, Eugene Stoner. Awesome. Uh, and I remember your name from the last one. So thank you very much, my friend. All right. Lots of folks here. We have... Couple thousand folks here already. If y'all could hit that like button, hit that thumbs up. It takes you about a second, but it absolutely helps get get this video through the anti-gun algorithm. 
um, and it really, really helps what we're trying to do here. <laughs> this is going to be good, Stan. I, I agree. Adam Evans, thank you. Appreciate you, man. I don't get to do this without y'all. Steve Franklin, good old friend of the channel, been around for a long time, man. <clears throat> the original sound, guys. Yeah, <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, for the first, uh, Steve helped me out. The first um, um, rally that I ever did was at the Massachusetts State Capitol, and uh, that was pretty cool on Beacon Hill. Thank you, man. I, I'll, I'll forever be grateful. Thank you. Hey, Cape Gunworths, Toby and the crew, appreciate y'all. Um, I'm going to say I can hear the echo, the the reverberance. I apologize. Like all of my equipment, all of my furniture is out of this place with, with the exception of the bare uh, essentials. So like this desk, this mic, that camera, these two lights and my monitors, that's it. I mean, my cup, <laughs> my Gundy, <laughs> and then, then the three documents behind me, that's all that's here. So I, I apologize. I will... Uh, I, I can't do much more for the sound, so I, I apologize. But we'll be listening to these uh, these creatures in Congress momentarily. Wow, Joel, thank you, man. Thanks for all your hard work and dedication. Michigan needs your support. We have a tyrannical legislature governor on E.G. Stom. Yes, I have done a couple of videos about what's going on when the bills were submitted. There's a few places in the country that uh, that need help, and the help is coming. For instance, yesterday in uh, in Washington, when the governor Inslee, when Governor Inslee signed the assault weapon ban and stuff. Uh, Immediately, FPC and SAF launched a lawsuit immediately upon signing it. Uh, so things are happening, and uh, it's it's good to see. I know people have their eye, already know people have their eye on Michigan as well. Gregory, thank you, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> Do you have snacks? <laughs> Actually, I don't. Uh, all I have on this uh, this level here is my coffee machine, so if I do get hungry, I'll be having some blackout coffee. Oh, man, I hope it's not 15 hours, boys and girls. <laughs> that would suck hard. <laughs> uh, IZI Prince would love an audio-only version of these hearings. Yeah, maybe I'll, I don't know. I was, I've been thinking about doing a podcast. Um, I'll leave it up to y'all. Me, I'm a visual learner. I prefer to see the video, to watch these people actually ask the questions, because for me, um, I, I've been trained very heavily in body language and how to read people. Um, so I am big into seeing how people's facial reactions are when they're saying something or reacting to something they've been asked, their body positioning, certain uh, things that they can't control. That's what I'm looking for when I see these things. So if you guys want just an audio version, sorry, uh, let me know and I'll consider doing that. But it's going to have to be a vast majority of people asking for it because, uh, uh, yeah. Tim, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Still waiting for these guys. They're two minutes and 50 seconds late. Nicholas, thank you. Appreciate it. Let me put it up here. Um, before I jump forward, uh, this has changed. My, As I've mentioned, my setup has changed. It's bare minimum. So in the event when this starts and I click over to them that you can't hear the audio, just let me know as soon as possible if you can or can't because I can make the change uh, before it gets too far and they say anything valuable. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. Appreciate it. Uh, Jeff, thank you. Michigan governor is going after concealed carry. Yep. I agree. Yes, uh, yes. She's she's copying what New York has done, um, what New Jersey and, and Maryland, all the anti-gun states. They're all doing the same thing. They just call it a little something different. Jason, here till the end, sir. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for what you do. Thanks to GOA and other organizations fighting for our rights. I'm right there with you. I agree. Uh, Jerky Lee, <laughs> good name. I'm stuck over here in Massachusetts, Dan Prave, the two-way. Yeah, man. It's uh, Massachusetts is. I don't think it's changing anytime soon as long as they keep voting deep, deep blue. Bill, thank you for your hard work. Thank you, Bill. That's so humbling, guys and gals. Appreciate you. Uh, Commie, Connecticut, <laughs> about uh, two and a half miles from here. Andy Zimmerman, senior chief, longtime follower. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. Much appreciated, brother. Skylar, keep an eye on the PA stuff. It's heating up here. Yes, I know that as well. Uh, VA Wolf, always here. Can always count on you, man. Hope to see this guy squirm. I, me too. That's why I wanted to watch this. Um, should literally be any second. So as soon as they go live, I'll shut up. <laughs> Everybody, most people are saying videos, man, but um, we'll see what we can do. Nicholas Geronimo, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much. Bill, thank you. Uh, wow, Greg, thank you, man. This isn't why I do this, guys. I just want everybody to be in the know, but thank you so much. 
for supporting what I do here. It means so much. Spirit, thank you. Spirit Walker. Uh, man, you guys are awesome. Visual learner, learner too. Damn boring. <laughs> Joe, thank you, man. No audio only. A lot of people are like me. They're visual. Echo 24. No, uh, I love knowing if I want a resource to go to find out what's going on. Chime in. Yeah, man. Thank you very much. That means a lot. That's why I do this. And uh, that's that's the ultimate compliment to know that people depend on my channel. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Yep, can't see him square him on audio only. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Timothy, to help other states be free from tyranny. Man, thank you. Thank you. Looks like we're going to have to do another donation. <laughs> freedom, you are a watchman on the walls of freedom. Thank you, man. I appreciate you, brother. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's a good question. How is there now 2,900 viewers live and only 400 plus thumbs up and likes? Can we fix that? Can we please fix that? Let's smash that thumbs up. Share this. Let people know it's on. If there's a couple thousand people here, I think we could do a couple thousand uh, likes. So please smash those. What it does is it tells the algorithm that people are watching this and this is something they should push. And we should want people to watch this. We should want people to see how crooked the ATF is and how... The director is being put on the carpet in the hot seat today. We should want everybody to see this because this is what actual uh, oversight of the ATF looks like. And we need more of it. So please smash that thumbs up. Werewolf. Got blackout coffee. And I got a good Kentucky bourbon. For <laughs> Thank you, brother. It's a little early. I guess it's, it's 5 p.m. somewhere, right? <laughs> oh, boy. I'm still waiting on him. Joshua Cornelius, complacency is the mother of tyranny. 100%. 100%. Deborah, thank you, Deborah. I appreciate you so much. Man, Bosovich, I sure hope not. I am not, I'm not prepared for a long one. I'm not prepared for a long one at all. CRS, absolutely. I did the video on that. If you haven't watched it, if you don't know what's going on, please take a second, go click over and watch my video, open it another uh, window or something. Uh, Matt got railroaded. Um, that's not the way the law is supposed to work. They're not supposed to try to keep you behind bars and t waste a ton of money and resources on it over a, a metal card that might one day be something if you machine it, yet let murderers out, let, let uh, or, or never even go after the folks from Epstein uh, Island's client list. Uh, we can go on and on on things that they don't do that they should, yet they're the ATF is focused on doing things that they shouldn't. Uh, yes, so check that out. Uh, 95 mix, MX Rider, ATF sent 16 out of state agents to a fresh gun store in here. Yes, yeah, so this is happening more and more. I, I remember that, and uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene was there for that one. They did that here in Massachusetts, so in not too far from here, there's a, a mill, an old mill, that has the largest number of FFLs under one roof. Last time I was there, it was like 84, 85 FFLs. Uh, and they sent a team just like that from across the country uh, to do mass inspections. And previously, it was like the local guys and gals would go do the inspections. And they're saying they're sending these huge groups from different states so that the local uh, ATF IOIs are not over overwhelmed and they can still do trace reports. And I'll tell you, from 24 years in law enforcement, there's not a lot of trace reports um, as much as they'll make you believe. Al, just want to show you a little love. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate all y'all, seriously. Uh, heavy. Like you, I look at their body language, 100%. That's why I do these. Um, I think it's important to see if somebody's lying, and you can tell. Justin, appreciate all you do, Patriot. Thank you, brother. The eye, Izzy eye prints again, only because I listen at work. Yeah, understandable, bro. Understandable. Lever action. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. <laughs> Greg, I, I agree. Can't wait to hear him choke. I'm already getting dry mouth. <laughs> Here we go. The committee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized sound, to declare a recess at any time. The chair would now ask the gentleman from Texas, uh, Sheriff Nels, if he would lead us in the pledge. I ask that everyone please join me, Stan, honoring our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the republic for which it stands, 
one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Um, we welcome everyone to today's hearing on oversight of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. The chair now recognizes himself for an opening statement. Here we go. You know what Americans can't stand? You know what they can't stand about this town? The so-called experts, the unelected experts who try to run our lives, never put their name on a ballot, never have to go talk to the American people, get elected, never have to run for office. Best example, of course, is Dr. Fauci, who ran our lives for two years and was wrong, wrong about just about everything he said. Told us it didn't, didn't start in a lab, it wasn't our tax dollars, wasn't gain of function research. He said there was no natural immunity, even though it always had been for every other virus. Said the vaccinated couldn't get it, said the vaccinated couldn't transmit it. And now it's the ATF, except with the ATF, they don't even claim to be experts. The director said so last week. Last week in a hearing in front of Congress in the Appropriations Committee, he was asked about firearms. He said, I'm not an expert in firearms. Not an expert, but still trying to run Americans' lives. You would think the head of the agency tasked with regulating the entire firearms industry, a constitutionally protected industry, would know something about firearms. Earlier this year, the ATF issued a rule that unilaterally puts new restrictions on Second Amendment rights. This rule redefined firearms with stabilizing braces as short-barreled rifles so that they could be controlled under the Gun Control Act of 1968, the National Firearms Act of 1934. There are approximately 40 million firearms with stabilizing braces currently in circulation. The pistol brace was created for use by disabled persons including disabled veterans. These individuals could lose the ability to use these tools and as a result may not be able to operate their firearm. Under the new rule, these firearm owners will be required to obtain special registration, surrender or destroy their brace by the compliance date, or they will face severe criminal penalties. This is not the result of a decision made by Congress. Congress didn't change the law. No bill was introduced in this committee passed by this committee, passed by the House, passed by the Senate, and signed by the President. Nope. This rule turns law-abiding gun owners into felons is a result of unelected bureaucrats simply enacting a new regulation. And that's not how it's supposed to work in our great country. Congress writes the laws and the executive branch enforces them. Here, the executive branch has taken power from Congress in deciding what the law should be, and that change and that they change themselves with enforcing, charge themselves with enforcing, excuse me. Director Dettelbach has in essence become a one-man Congress. Notably, this decision runs counter to the ATF decision under President Obama in 2012 that a firearm equipped with a stabilizing brace was, quote, would not be subject to the National Firearms Act and those controls. An independent analysis of financial harm to the firearms industry from the pistol brace ban has been estimated to exceed a billion dollars. Law-abiding firearm owners relied on this ruling for a decade before having the rug pulled out from under them this year by Director Dettelbach's ATF. And it's not just with the stabilizing brace rule that the ATF is attacking the Second Amendment. They've also targeted firearms businesses by creating pretenses to shut them down. The new classifications are left purposely broad and allow the ATF to revoke the license licenses of FFLs for simple technical and non-material paperwork violations. In 2022, ATF revoked over 90 licenses, more than any year since 2006. This is an attack on the Second Amendment, pure and simple, plain and simple. And I want to thank Director Edelbach for appearing before us today, and we look forward to hearing from him and his taking our questions. With that, I would yield to the ranking member for his opening statement. The Penguin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by first apologizing for the uh, slander we heard this morning directed at one of the great public servants of our time, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Ugh. Mr. Chairman, violence continues to take the lives of more than 100 Americans every single day. It changes how safe we feel in our homes, in our schools, and in our houses of worship. It reduces vibrant cities to somber headlines. It takes our loved ones, old and young, and leaves us with another anniversary of lives cut short 
and the community forever traumatized. We've already lost more than 13,000 Americans to gun deaths so far this year, including 80 young children, 469 teens, and 18 law enforcement officers. We are the only nation in the industrialized world that tolerates such gruesome statistics. It's against this sobering background that Republicans have called this hearing to criticize the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the law enforcement agency tasked with keeping guns out of the wrong hands. At least Republicans are transparent about their goal, to pressure, intimidate, and hamstring the agency so that it can no longer effectively do its job and protect Americans from violent crime. Some Republicans have even introduced a bill to abolish the ATF altogether. That's right. They seek to eliminate the law enforcement agency responsible for protecting communities from gun violence, stopping gun trafficking, and ensuring lawful and responsible gun ownership. Yep. Local law enforcement depends on the ATF to provide resources that help them solve crimes and prevent gun violence. In a recent president's message in Police Chief Magazine, International Association of Chiefs of Police President John Latenny encourages fellow police chiefs to, quote, take advantage of the no-cost systems offered by the ATF to help investigate and ultimately remove dangerous weapons from our communities, close quote. He noted that, quote, ATF has the only gun tracing platform in the United States that can be used by local, state, federal, and global law enforcement agencies to investigate criminal gun activity, close quote. ATF also runs the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, which provides local, state, tribal, and federal law enforcement at no cost with ballistic imaging, a critical tool that can help solve crime and prevent further gun violence. ATF also carries out its mission by lending its expertise, such as by classifying weapons, advising prosecutors, and promulgating regulations, and by collaborating with various law enforcement agencies. As Chief Oteni explains, collaboration can improve overall violence reduction strategies while allowing each piece of the system to focus on what they do best. Clearly, the president of the International Association of Chiefs of Police sees the great value that ATF provides. But some Republicans seek to abolish this agency and to end the work that it does to, to make Americans safer. Other Republicans merely seek to starve the agency of funding, to place additional restrictions on the use of its data to help solve crimes and keep the community safe, or to dismantle its regulations. In fact, just last week, this committee voted to prevent the ATF from regulating stabilizing braces, a device used in multiple mass shootings, including most recently in Nashville, to convert a pistol into a more dangerous short-barreled rifle. We just heard the chairman excoriate the ATF by saying it adopted this rule on gun braces without congressional action, without the Senate, the House, and the President signing it. Well, that's the function of any executive agency entrusted by Congress with making rules. Wrong. How can it be that the majority says it stands with law enforcement, yet it seeks to abolish the only law enforcement agency with the, with the capability of tracing gun crimes, of tracing crime guns, I should say? How can the majority say that they support state and local police while attempting to hamstring and starve the agency that provides them with so many critical resources for solving crime, including homicides, gun trafficking, and organized crime? The answer lies in another part of ATF's responsibilities, making sure that gun dealers follow the law by conducting background checks, refusing to sell to those who are not allowed to have firearms, and keeping records so that gu crime guns can be traced. The overwhelming majority of gun sellers have no problem following these laws. But when gun dealers willfully refuse to follow them, it is ATF's responsibility to revoke their license to sell. The ATF upheld that responsibility last year, revoking 92 licenses for gun sellers with serious willful violations, a tiny fraction of the over 130,000 licensed firearm dealers. But gun groups cried foul, claiming that such revocations are crushing gun sellers, revoking 92 out of, three, out of 130,000 licenses. And then Republicans introduced legislation 
to abolish the ATF. Republicans' priorities are clear. They would prefer to keep every gun store in the country open, even those that willfully violate the law, rather than to let ATF save lives simply by enforcing the law. It is essential that we conduct oversight of our agencies to ensure that they are fulfilling their missions. But today's hearing makes no attempt to fulfill that responsibility. Instead, it shows how radically out of step my Republican colleagues are with the American people, with law enforcement, and even with many responsible gun owners. Democrats have put forth a range of solutions to prevent gun violence, to support law enforcement, and to solve crimes. But our colleagues across the aisle continue to push for unfettered access to assault weapons, concealable rifles, and ghost guns. As Republicans continue to seek freedom from gun regulation, we will continue to seek communities free from gun violence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back without objection. All of their opening statements will be included in the record. We will now introduce today's witness. Mr. Dettelbach, uh, the Honorable Stephen Dettelbach uh, was sworn in as director of the ATF on July 13th, 2022. As director, he is responsible for leading an agency charged with enforcing, <clears throat> excuse me, laws and regulations related to firearms, explosives, arson, alcohol, tobacco, and tobacco trafficking. He previously served as U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio. Uh, and in various positions with the Department of Justice and U.S. Attorney's offices, welcome our witness today and thank him for appearing. We, we will begin by swearing you in. Would you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record show the witness has answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Uh, please be seated. Uh, please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony, and you've done this before, Mr. Dettelbach. Uh, you get five minutes, you know how it works, and then we'll, we'll proceed with questioning. So, Mr. Dettelbach, uh, Dettelbach you, can, uh, you can start your testimony. Good morning, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of the committee. I'm honored to appear before this committee to discuss the public safety mission of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Uh, I'm also honored to represent the dedicated men and women of ATF who work tirelessly and often risk everything alongside our law enforcement partners to protect the American people from violent crime. At ATF, everything we do begins and ends with public safety. ATF is a small law enforcement agency, just over 5,100 employees, with a huge mission to prevent, disrupt, and reduce violent crime. As director of ATF, I am briefed uh, on what feels like countless murders and shootings that take place across the United States every day. This includes the mass murder incidents that often grab national headlines, such as last month's horrific murders at the Tennessee school. But it also includes countless shootings that take place every day, devastate families and communities, but don't make the news. By some counts, so far this year, there have already been 174 mass shootings. No, there hasn't. And 99 law enforcement officers had been shot in the line of duty. Every day, more than 100 people in America die from gun violence, and many more are permanently injured. Victims and survivors of gun violence deserve better, as do their families, their communities, and law enforcement officers, including those at ATF and our local partners, who every day run toward the gunfire. The level of gun violence in America is quite simply unacceptable. Because of the way our constitutional system is designed, fighting violent crime falls first to local, state, and tribal law enforcement. And we at ATF are deeply committed to supporting them in those efforts. ATF embodies the Department of Justice's commitment to combat violent crime by being a force multiplier to our law enforcement partners. We stand shoulder to shoulder with them each day to help reduce and fight violent crime all over this nation. That's what ATF agents did with the brave men and women of the Tulare County Sheriff's Department recently when they took gunfire standing side by side to arrest a mass killer in Goshen, California. That person had allegedly executed a 10-month-old baby. And we do that all the time with our partners. There is really no better partner for the courageous people in local law enforcement than their courageous partners at ATF. ATF's efforts are driven by two priorities. Get shooters off the street and cut off the unlawful supply of firearms that fuels their violence. 
One of our greatest assets in accomplishing these priorities is our expertise in crime gun intelligence. Crime gun intelligence is ATF's ability to squeeze every last bit of evidence out of a firearm used in a crime so that together with our state and local partners, we can find the trigger pullers who are terrorizing our communities and put them where they belong, in jail. The National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, NIBIN, allows us to connect disparate shootings through ballistic evidence. E-Trace allows us to trace a crime gun back to its first known retail purchase. These tools are pillars of crime gun intelligence. And now we have the ability to get DNA on guns and cartridge casings, an exciting and potentially game-changing way to catch the shooters. All of these tools are critical to interrupting the shooting cycle and preventing the movement of lawful firearms into unlawful commerce. We must cut off the illegal flow of firearms to those who wish to harm our communities, such as those who use firearms to further gang violence or commit heinous attacks on schools or churches or movie theaters or grocery stores. And we must do that while respecting the rights of law-abiding citizens as well, and we can. Last June, Congress passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which gave ATF two new tools, a standalone federal straw purchasing and standalone gun trafficking statute for the first time. ATF and the Department of Justice have already brought charges against more than 30 defendants for violations of these new provisions. For instance, ATF led an investigation in the Northern District of Texas that led to the conviction of a person who was trafficking over 230 firearms across the southern border to Mexico. We also work closely with licensed firearms dealers, who are often the first line of defense in our efforts to stop the diversion of firearms into illegal markets. Congress has given ATF the responsibility to regulate the firearms and explosives industry. ATF's regulatory efforts include inspections, rulemaking, and working with industry to promote education campaigns, and also, we respond day or night to every single burglary or robbery of a firearms dealer that we find out about. I want to end by just saying that everything we do at ATF begins and ends with public safety. Whether it's agents in a homicide unit or on a gang task force or, or some up. lab specialist running a DNA test late at night to help or police with a mass shooting or inspectors going at 2 a.m. to an FFL that's gotten a burglary. Our goal as one ATF is to promote public safety and reduce violent crime to protect the American people. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you, Director. The uh, Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas for his five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dunnelbeck, I, I want to get a better sense over here. I want to get a better sense of where the ATF's pistol brace rule derived from, uh, and I, I'd ask that you please elaborate on ATF's decision-making process, specifically uh, in issuing the pistol brace final rule uh, did the ATF consider the several years of ATF opinions, uh, including from the Obama administration, remember, the Obama administration, contradicting the final stabilizing brace rule? Uh, so with respect to the, the origin of the authority, as has been stated, um, um, ATF uh, derives its rulemaking authority in this matter from primarily the National Firearms Act, which was a congressional act uh, passed right, in 1934. Fair enough. Fair I'm enough. Sorry. I need to interrupt for a minute. In 2012, John Spencer, you know who John Spencer is? Do you know John Spencer? I, I, I don't know that. He name. was the chief of ATF's firearm technology branch in 2012, and he wrote a letter to Alex Bosco. Do you know who Alex Bosco is? Uh, I do. Who is it? Uh, Alex Bosco appeared before this committee, I think, uh, a couple weeks yeah, ago. but who is he? And, and he's an individual who... Now, uh, he's the one that invented <laughs> the stabilizing brace. He's the one that invented it. So John Spencer the chief of ATS firearm technology branch, pretty smart guy, probably got a 10 pound brain. He then sends a letter to Alex Bosco, the inventor of the stabilizing brace and says, quote, based on our evaluation, FTB finds that the submitted firearm brace, the one that we're talking about, when attached to a firearm, does not convert that weapon to be fired from the shoulder and would not alter would not alter the classification of a pistol or other firearm. He continues, while a firearm so equipped would still be regulated by the Gun Control Act, such a firearm would not be subject to the NFA controls. Was this letter, my friend, was this letter considered before issuing the final rule? 
uh, there's a very lengthy public record of all the things so that was, were considered. So just a simple and, yes or no. And, and, was and this letter considered all, before issuing the final rule? It's just simple. Did you know about this letter? Were you aware of it? it and is, did you consider it? Uh, the, the public record is clear all right. this and all is the, the goal, my friend, is the goal of the ATF 7.4% budget increase? Is the goal of the ATF to go after and criminalize law-abiding Americans? Is that what you're asking for, 7.4 more percent? The goal of There's 40 million of them out there, 40 million of them that have this. I am one of those proud veterans. I view this ATF's recent pistol brace rule as a direct assault on veterans and law-abiding citizen American Second Amendment rights. Stabilizing braces are often used by and were originally created for, ask Mr. Bosco, were created for wounded and disabled Americans just like this man right here. That's how you use that, just like that guy right there. What, what enforcement mechanisms? I, I, I'm trying to figure out how this works. What enfor enforcement mechanisms will the ATF impose, uh, utilize to impose fines or maybe up to 10 years of jail time for those that do not comply or maybe even those that aren't even aware of the final pistol brace rule? How are you going to do that? So, Congressman, uh, with respect to the, the process and the letter that you referred yeah. to, that was a letter uh, that was about a specific product, one product, my time is limited. I asked for a simple yes or no on that. You refused. I want to ask you, what <laughs> enforcement mechanisms will the ATF utilize to enforce this? Uh, ATF's mission remains focused on protecting the American people right. from violent crime. We target our resources okay, on I, violent people. All right, all right. I, I, I have a minute left, and I'm still trying to get you to answer my question. Hypothetically speaking, if I fail to comply with the ATF's final rule, by May 31st now, May 31st, what will the ATF do to me or 40 other million Americans? Uh, with respect to all of the, the authorities that ATF has, uh, we target our investigations Next on thing violence, you'll probably be violence, saying that you're going to have to go door to door. My point is this. Local law enforcement pulls over a car. The guy's drunk. All of a sudden, he's doing an inventory. He finds one of these braces in the back of his car, right? Yeah. And that brace hasn't been registered because the guy had no clue this was even out there. Are you going to put that guy in jail for that brace? What is local law enforcement going to do? So, Hurry up, I got 15 seconds. So with respect to a brace in and of itself, the ATF doesn't deal with the brace. The ATF deals with the weapon as assembled as a whole, determining whether it's a short-barreled rifle, which is a determination made. I'm not getting anything from evaluation. him. I just want the American people, everybody to understand, you're going after veterans, individuals like myself, like this guy, with the Gentlemen's, resources they currently have. Gentlemen's I time. yield back, sir. Gentlemen's, I know I'm out of time. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Nadler. Thank you. Let me first make clear that the brace that's been sir approved never made it to the market. Mr. Bosco changed the design dramatically. By the time the rule was issued, the brace designs had changed dramatically, so they weren't dealing with the same thing. Uh, Mr. Be Dettelbach, despite the complaints of my colleagues across the aisle, Congress and the Attorney General have delegated to ATF the authority to issue rules and regulations to enforce the provisions of the National Firearms Act of 1934 and the Gun Control Act of 1968. Does ATF's rulemaking authority include the authority to clarify or interpret terms used in those statutes? ATF uh, was delegated rulemaking authority by Answers, Congress, yes. and we can, we, we can do that, yes. And is this any different from the authority given to other executive agencies? Uh, Congress determines the amount of authority given, but it is not uncommon to have the kind of rulemaking authority that Congress has decided to give to ATF. Thank you. Is ATF also often called upon to apply those statutes to new technologies developed by the gun industry? Uh, when new technologies uh, develop, sometimes ATF is called upon to evaluate them and to apply Congress's rules to new technologies. Yes. Thank you. For how long has ATF been doing the work of interpreting and clarifying statutes p passed by Congress regarding firearms? Um, since uh, before it was even called ATF, right? So, so back in the 1930s, when in, when Congress passed the National Firearms Act, it delegated to ATF to what was then the Treasury Department, I believe, of rulemaking authority, and that rulemaking authority has been delegated in other statutes by Congress. So for 70 years, basically, and probably uh, closer to 100. Okay. In deciding how to apply those statutes to emerging technologies. 
Does ATF rely on the expertise of technological experts as well as legal counsel? Uh, ATF uses all its resources and employees and expertise to follow the law as Congress has passed it and to implement those laws to protect the American people. The gun industry has a history of developing new technologies aimed at uh, circumventing the nation's firearms. Technologies such as bump stocks, ghost guns, and stabilizing braces. Can you please explain how ATF determines when it is necessary to publish a notice of proposed rulemaking to clarify how statutory terms apply to emerging technologies? Um, so uh, at ATF, uh, we obviously are looking at uh, violent crime. We're looking at public safety issues. Uh, and, and we're also looking, as you said, at changes in uh, behavior. And we're trying to apply uh, the, the laws as Congress passes them to a dynamic public safety and, and to new products that come out. Uh, it's not so much our concern what the motivation behind those products are, uh, uh, but we do have to apply the law as Congress wrote it uh, to the current situation faced by the American public. Uh, that's what we try to do our best at ATF. We look at all the factors out there. We look at the, the public safety threat, uh, and we try to do our best to, to, to take the language Congress wrote and to apply it to individual situations to enforce the law. Thank you. What would happen to ATF and the agency's ability to accomplish its mission if funding is cut, particularly considering the recent surge in gun violence and the years-long boom in firearm purchases? ATF is a small agency with an immense mission, protecting people from violent crime. And we work very closely with state and local law enforcement. Cuts to, we do, we're not a large agency. There's not a lot of fat. You're cutting into bone. <laughs> it would mean task force officers pulled from homicide units solving murder cases. It would mean carjacking cases and killings going unsolved. It would mean us not helping local law enforcement on gang task forces, working on cartel matters, uh, us not being able to respond to firearms dealers, mass shooters. Uh, there's a variety of important public safety things uh, that ATF stretch, stretch very thin to do as it is now. And what could ATF accomplish with greater resources? With greater resources, all of those things I talked about, uh, helping to catch shooters and trigger pullers with local law enforcement, uh, helping to try and make sure we're getting to them the crime gun intelligence they need to see who are the trigger pullers, who are the worst of the worst, and how can we work together to catch them and put them in jail. We could do more uh, to support them. Everywhere I go in this country, um, I talk to chiefs, sheriffs, uh, community members, and it doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the country or on a coast, in a, in a sheriff's department, in a rural area, or on a suburb or in a city. They all say the same thing to me, all of them. Send us more ATF resources so we can help fight violent crime. Uh, that's what we would do with those resources. Thank you. My last question, in what ways does ATF work with state, local, and international law enforcement agencies to protect the American public from gun violence? We work every day, all the time, shoulder to shoulder, with them as they run into the gunfire to protect our communities. These local law enforcement people who work with us at ATF together are courageous people, they're heroes, and they deserve all of our respect and support. Thank you very much, and accept my uh, uh, congratulations on a job well done, and I yield gentlemen's, back. Gentlemen's time to expire. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that uh, uh, the ATF director article dated 4-25-2023 uh, be placed into uh, the record. Not objection. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, uh, are you an expert uh, in firearms? Uh, if you're referring to the statement I made, there was a member who was a veteran. I respect very much people's service to our military. Um, who said that he had been uh, an expert. I told him I might not be an expert to the same extent he is, and I'm certainly not an expert to the same extent that people who work for decades at ATF as firearms experts who examine the mechanics, velocity, speeds, uh, the me uh, Okay, I'll take, th I'll take that as I'm not an expert <laughs> at some level. Uh, are you an expert on tobacco? Uh, I spent my career as a federal prosecutor putting gang members, violent criminals, cartel cases No, I, I appreciate that. That's, I, that's please, my please. background. Yeah, so uh, I just, I want to get the yes or no's, uh, try to make it quick. I'm not, I'm not expecting a yes, to be honest. You're not an expert on tobacco. You're not an expert on uh, guns. Are you an expert on uh, explosives? Uh, I have prosecuted cases involving the attempted terroristic bombing of a bridge in, in Ohio, in, near Cleveland, where you're from. 
I have dealt with the firebombing of the Mansfield, Ohio Do you know what PETN is? I'm sorry? You know what PETN is? Uh, I, I don't hold myself out as a technical expert in every aspect of okay, firearms, but, have but you I'm an with... expert in dealing with violent okay, crime. Okay, so, so you're, you're, you, you know what a prosecutor knows. You have no expertise specifically in what the men and women of the ATF uh, in various stages are experts on. Is that correct? Uh, respectfully, I, I, ATF is a law enforcement agency. I have worked with ATF and law enforcement agencies, okay. including police my okay. whole I'm, career. I'm, I'm trying not to get frustrated over not getting an answer to <laughs> yes or no, so let's move on. Uh, during your earlier testimony, you just said that, uh, uh, that you, you look at behavior to decide about rulemaking. Is that correct? That's what I heard. Uh, what we look at is we look at the entire... Uh, okay, I have very limited time, and I, 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 I only ask for the... You can expand afterwards, but a yes or no. You said you looked at behavior. I, I, I don't recall the exact words. What we look at is we look at the laws that Congress passes and the public safety threats facing America. Okay. So as you look at behavior, which the record will show you you were saying, uh, d does the Second Amendment, the Constitution, forgetting about statute, because you can forget about statute, tr Constitution clearly trumps statutes. The Constitution has a right to keep and bear arms. Does behavior change the interpretation of the Second Amendment, in um, your opinion as an attorney? Uh, I think the Supreme Court has ruled, and, and uh, more than once, that the right to keep and bear arms is an individual right uh, okay, uh, so, possessed so, by Americans. So we have a right to keep and bear arms. Uh, you, you spent a lot of time talking about various things. Today we're talking about the brace uh, at, at some length, I suspect. Does the brace increase the accuracy of a pistol, in your uh, opinion, to the extent that you know? Congress said... No, no, don't answer... No, excuse me. I have limited time, and I insist on your answering the questions I ask, or don't waste the, any of our time. To the extent that you know enough to have pr proposed a rule that bans or registers braces, does a brace increase the accuracy of a pistol? My understanding is that Congress determined that the ability to shoulder short-barreled rifles okay. made them, quote, you're, you're, unusually dangerous. You're not? Okay, unusually dangerous because it increases the accuracy. Unusually dangerous because okay. Congress said So let's understand something. I, I appreciate you telling me what our body does, but you, you, you have two, two types of weapon, a pistol and a rifle. A rifle is more accurate than a pistol because it is better braced, correct? Uh, shouldered, I believe that Congress determined that when weapons could be shouldered and also concealed, that they were unusually dangerous. Okay, so you're not answering any of the questions, but I'll, 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 I'll put one more statement out there. Rifles are in, and, and look, I'm an EOD tech by training. Uh, I know more about explosives than I do about firearms, so we're just gonna go through this. Have, having been a sharpshooter in the military, having been qualified, I know that my 45 is not as, as accurate uh, when fired as a rifle. But nowhere in the Constitution does it say that the accuracy of a weapon somehow changes the category for purposes of the Second Amendment. By your saying that, that a, a, a brace is in fact going to limit the ability of somebody to have it, what you are clearly doing is you are, you are making decisions based on your interpretation of behavior and risk and not based on the Constitution. So uh, we look forward to additional uh, uh, dialogue with you. I would appreciate in the future that you really do consider whether or not a yes or no should be answered first before you go on with what Congress has passed. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, welcome and thank you very much for your leadership and congratulations for your appointment. Uh, let me also congratulate and thank the men and women of the ATF who every day are standing on the front lines uh, trying to ensure uh, that uh, the American people are safe. Uh, Mr. Director, uh, it is interesting this query of what your expertise is. The expertise is amongst the thousands of men and women who this uh, group of friends on the other side of the aisle wish to abolish. So the folk that they're citing of experts, they want to just throw them out. Let me be very clear. 
My friends on the other side of the aisle want to abolish the ATF. All the persons that they have cited, sending letters, knowing the rules, being experts, all of them they want uh, to abolish. Let me um, just hold up uh, just to give Uh, just to um, pay tribute and acknowledge uh, that these are the deceased, their families are still mourning Was that uh, a of brace? the incident uh, in Buffalo at the grocery store. It was an assault weapon it was that the killed them. I question to you is just simply a yes or no. You know what an assault weapon is? You've seen one. Uh, Again, that would be a decision for Congress to make respectfully as to make that definition. It's, it is, uh, there, are, there are numerous different legislative bodies that have taken up that question. Uh, they have if all- If we laid a had, weapon on the table, you could pretty much say that falls in the category of assault weapon. Respectfully, uh, I, I, that is a decision that different legislative bodies have come up with different definitions for. It would be for the legislators to make that determination as to how they would define it, unless they were to delegate that authority to ATF. Let me uh, move on. Um, I know that um, I had the privilege of uh, being at the uh, testing site um, in Houston, and thank you for coming to Houston. Uh, this is a picture of the actual um, equipment that tests uh, gun tracing. Could you just quickly say what that does and how that impacts reducing crime? Very quickly, my time is short. Crime gun intelligence, including firearms tracing, happens when a local law enforcement agency has a crime that they're investigating. And they want to trace the firearm that was used to hurt or kill somebody to its first retail purchase. It helps them to identify the trigger pullers, and it helps them to take them off the streets. In recent years, AR-style pistols equipped with stabilizing braces have been used in several mass shootings. Is that correct? That is, that is public record. That is correct. The shooter who killed nine people and injured 17 in Dayton used an AR-15 with stabilizing brace. Is that correct? My understanding is that is correct. The shooter who killed 10 people, including a police officer in Boulder, Colorado, a Ruger pistol equipped with a tactical brace. Is that correct? Uh, my understanding is that is correct. The shooter who killed five people and injured 19 others at Club Q in Colorado Springs in 2022 used a pistol equipped with an SB tactical stabilizing. Is that correct? From the public pictures in that case, uh, uh, my understanding is that is correct. Just four weeks ago, the shooter who killed three children, three adults in Nashville used a pistol equipped with a stabilizing brace, correct? No. Again, from the public pictures in that case, that is correct. The first stabilizing brace that Alex Bosco submitted to ATF for classification in 2012, the one he claims he originally designed to help his disabled veteran friend shoot a large pistol from the forearm with more control, did that brace ever make it to market unmodified? My understanding is that that particular product uh, was not ever uh, produced and marketed. And, uh, and I think I read in Mr. Bosco's testimony that he said that some people were Mr. using Bosco braces. Mr. Bosco said that he ways. wanted to make sure that he did not have any equipment that would help kill a police officer or, may, or kill innocent persons. He did answer that question to me. Does the final ban, rule ban, of uh, the final rule ban firearms that are equipped with a stabilizing brace? Absolutely not. The rule doesn't ban anything. It imposes the congressionally uh, articulated controls on. on certain weapons. Thank you. Much has been said about ATF's recent rule regarding stabilizing braces, but I would like to discuss auto sears or switches that turn off and um, basically so we're here for um, one reason but I want to talk about that rule else. can you just give a quick quick as I have seconds and I want to get to another question um, right now our police officers and communities are facing machine gun fire from uh, automatic conversion devices that turn lawful semi-auto weapons into unlawful machine guns it's a very dangerous situation and my next question is what are you hearing from state and local law enforcement offices about the ATF all the police chiefs and sheriffs I talk to uh, want to have increased resources and partnerships with ATF to catch violent criminals. And veterans have other options. General, the time the gentleman lady that the the veterans lady, have, you're not blocking back. veterans from being gentleman able, from, disabled persons, from being able to have the right kind of race. from Colorado is recognized. Mr. Chairman, that information should be on the record that these uh, races the do not you, stop. You, it's on the record. You said it. Veterans from getting it. the right equipment that We're they good. need. We got that should not be a misrepresentation in this hearing. 
Okay, but the, also, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Also, what happens courtesy. in a hearing is you get five minutes, and I've been generous in giving you a few you extra have, seconds. You have, and thank you. I wanted to make now sure we time got is, the record straight. The time thank now you. now belongs to Mr. Buck from Colorado. I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your courtesy. Point of order or not? I'm, I'm sorry. I was. I was. I didn't hear you over. Over the. the, the <laughs> I'm sorry. From, I, from the gentleman from Texas. Yeah, my my point of order is, um, this that's a routine feature. Uh, that's not a glitch that she accidentally went over routinely and so the point of order is this how can we make sure everybody adheres to the five minute rule mr chairman usually the, the the custom of the committee i think the custom of the of the previous chairman is if you ask a question within your five minutes we will give the witness time to respond and i've been doing that miss uh miss jackson lee was very close on whether she got the question at the end of her five minutes we now recognize the gentleman from colorado for five minutes I thank the chair, um, and I want to just mention one thing to the gentle lady from uh, Texas. I do not, uh, I am not in favor of abolishing the ATF, and I want to thank the ATF for increasing the number of uh, 922 G1 felon in possession cases in the last few years. I think it's absolutely essential that ATF stay focused on its mission, and that is to help local police make this uh, country safer by actually. Uh, taking guns away from dangerous, violent felons. That may be where we end our commonality, but it starts in, in a good place. And, and I think ATF, I've worked with ATF for uh, 25 years as a prosecutor, have a great deal of respect for the men and women who work um, on the streets uh, in our country, uh, making this country safer. Uh, if we stayed focused on violent criminals, um, we could reduce the crime, especially in urban America, uh, where it is so dangerous. And so thank you uh, for that aspect of your job. Um, I want to just ask the uh, director, um, do you know why the uh, Capitol building is on the Hill? It's because we overlook the executive branch. Do you know why Article I of the Constitution talks about the uh, legislative functions? It's because our founders thought that the legislative branch was preeminent and was uh, 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 supposed to stop the tyranny of the executive, the reason that our uh, founders fought the revolution, to get away from a king. And do you know why June 15th, 1215 is an important date? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear it. June 15th, 1215. Uh, I, it's when the Magna Carta was signed. I was going to guess that, but I didn't okay. want well, to no, get it No, it's a wrong. good guess. And, that, and actually, it was signed in uh, Windsor, and I'm from Windsor, Colorado, and I don't see any area of Windsor, Colorado where it could have been signed. But um, <laughs> it, it, is, uh, it was signed, and it was really the beginning of holding the executive, in this case the monarchy, responsible uh, for its actions. And what I see from ATF too often... And I've already told you, I think it has an important and valuable role. But what I see too often is ATF taking a legislative function and running with it. And that's what scares me about ATF and where this administration, and, and I don't think there's any doubt that this administration is more pro-gun control than the past administration or that the Democrats are more pro-gun control than Republicans. But when you take a legislative function and you, by rule, um, go forward and usurp our authority. Now, we aren't going to get it right every time, and we're not going to do things very quickly. Our founders set, it, set this whole system up so that we wouldn't do things very quickly, that we would do things in a measured way. But the fact that when we pass a law, we have um, a consensus in this country, and when you pass a rule, you don't. And that's the difference. And if we don't get the American people on board with where we want to go uh, in terms of violence in this country, we suffer. And I'll give you two examples that, that concern me. One is uh, uh, the suppressor, uh, the, the ability to make sure that individuals can purchase suppressors and use the same e-filing system that has been set up has been slow walked by your agency, not you, but slow walked by your agency for more than a decade now. Mm -hmm. And it's the bureaucrats in your agency that have a concern about suppressors. I can tell you story after story of constituents who have a son or daughter 
who has a hearing disability, and those suppressors are so valuable to those kids to be able to enjoy uh, shooting sports. Um, it, over and over, I hear about the value of uh, suppressors and how f uh, just frustrating it is that the same old paperwork has to be uh, filled out and the time is, is wasted in getting a suppressor. And then, of course, the pistol brace uh, rules that, that your agency has uh, enacted um, concern me. And I'm going to give you the remainder, remainder of my time um, to, to respond to that. But um, I, I think that you have to acknowledge that the uh, legislative branch has a function and the executive branch, um, in, in fact, um, I guess I'm not going to give you much time. Um, Montesquieu, uh, I, I'll, I'll give you time to respond. Uh, we are in agreement about the, the, the roles of those two branches. The legislature, Congress <laughs> writes the laws, and we have to act within the language of the laws that Congress writes. There's, of course, a third branch uh, that is uh, uh, responsible when cases are brought about saying uh, whether we got it right or whether we did something that we weren't supposed to do or and what the laws of Congress is, you know, what they mean. And that's, of course, the judiciary. I, th I thank our the cases, director's first response, the, and I yield the, back, to Mr. Chairman. The first case on the stabilizing Thanks, race sir. that has been Mr. Uh, Chairman, opined on back. Uh, is, is a court yep. uh, that has said that we acted within the statute in enacting uh, that rule. Yeah, Sixth Circuit just said the opposite about the bump stock yesterday. <laughs> so uh, I, think the court, I think the court cases are mixed. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from uh, Cohen. Mr. Cohen from Tennessee, excuse me. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Massey and I have had discussions in the past about good guys with guns, uh, good people with guns, but good guys is what they kind of say. And he says good guys with guns often are there and they protect people. Ms. Jackson Lee asked you about a bunch of stabilizing uh, that were used, stabilizers that were used in mass shootings. So there, there's a history of stabilizing guns or rifles, whatever, being used in mass shootings. Is that true? Short, I think the questions were, I took them to be about short barreled rifles um, and, and equipped with stabilizing braces. Okay. Have you ever heard of a person with a short stabilized or rifle, whatever? Being, uh, coming and using it to defend somebody, a good guy with a gun? Um, I, I don't know, but these are lawful weapons, and I assume that people who follow the rules use them for all the lawful purposes that, the, uh, that they can be used for. Do you have to put your gun together to stabilize it, or is it you kind of take it around? It's like a... Well, I, uh, <laughs> when, when people... Basically, the rule deals with this situation, which is there are short-barreled rifles that are sold in one piece, and then what happened in the market was people uh, designed uh, stabilizing braces that could be attached to large frame pistols so that basically you were making the exact same weapon in two pieces. Right. Uh, those weapons are not banned. They have never been banned. There, it, Congress just determined there was increased uh, uh, controls that had to be imposed on those. But to the best of your knowledge, nobody's ever used one of those to defend somebody. I, I, I wouldn't know. We, we Mostly don't. they're used by we, people who go out with the intent to kill people. Well, we don't. Uh, seek to investigate and monitor the conduct of law-abiding citizens who are using firearms for lawful purposes. That's not what we do at ATF. He's not helping the left. President Trump asked ATF to work with the bump stocks, right? That happened in the last administration, that is correct, after the Las Vegas massacre. And, and Mr. Jordan made a point about some issues. He said it was not passed by the House and the Senate and signed by the President. That wasn't passed by the House and the Senate and signed by the President, was it? It was just Mr. Trump asked it to be done. My understanding is those rules were issued and our legal papers, there's hundreds of pages with our position on this that are public, was passed under the same rulemaking authority that Congress gave under the National Firearms Act. Do you have any knowledge of whether or not there were members of Congress who wrote to the ATF after Mr. Trump did this and said, this is a usurpation of our power, and we're up on this hill and overlooking this. Yes, yes, they did. There is litigation with a massive administrative record. There are letters uh, from uh, interested groups and members of Congress. I don't know, but that would be the place to look to see about that. Memphis has a crime problem and a gun problem, and I have met with the, your representatives in Nashville and Memphis both, the Nashville Field Division, and we appreciate what they're doing, and the police department appreciates what they're doing, too. They helped them in quite a few cases. Uh, the uh, most crimes in Memphis are committed with handguns. 
And recently, I've heard about Glock switches that have been confiscated in Memphis at the port and recovered by Memphis police. Can you tell us what a Glock switch is and why they're so dangerous and what the FDA, ATF is doing about them? Glock switches are small devices. They actually can look innocuous and sometimes blend with the firearm, but they convert a semi-automatic pistol into an unlawful, fully automatic machine gun. They override some of the functions to do that. Um, and I have met with chiefs around the country. I think one chief, I remember him saying to me very vividly when I asked what the problems are, he says, it's raining Glock switches. Um, so, you know, if you're executing a search warrant as a police officer uh, and you're knocking police with the warrant, in that time it took me to do that, now the person on the other side of the door might be able to fire 40 rounds uh, through the door. Uh, it's an extremely dangerous situation for the American public and for law enforcement. How are Glocks, which is regulated? They're not new. They're unlawful. So machine gun conversion devices under the National Firearms Act are unlawful. Um, and they are hard to detect. They are flooding it into our community. People are printing them on 3D printers. It is a significant public safety threat. And we are working as hard as we can with what we have with our local partners to try and get ahead of that. But it's hard. So that's part of what you get is an increase. What you do is you have to look after Glock switches too. Uh, of course, when people... Let me ask you this. We only have a few seconds left. The, the red flag laws have been discussed in the last bill, we, the quote-unquote bipartisan uh, gun bill. Uh, we had uh, some incentives for states to have red flag laws. Does the administration, would the administration support a federal red flag law? And uh, uh, again, uh, I, I, I think, you know, the president has been clear on the various things that he has called on Congress to do. Uh, as ATF director, my job is to take what comes out of that debate and squeeze every last bit of public safety out of it. Thank you for your service and to the gentlemen and the ladies that work with you, and God bless them. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act is a law that provides important immunity to manufacturers and sellers of firearms from being liable when people misuse their products. There have been numerous instances, whether intentional or unintentional, of Biden administration officials and anti-gun advocates and even the president himself mischaracterizing that immunity provision that's contained in the statute. And, and I think the public would benefit from our setting the record straight on the issue. So, Mr. Dettelbach, as the director of ATF, do you, do you agree with President Biden that this law's broad immunity means blanket immunity and that gun manufacturers are the only industry in America exempted from being sued by the public? Uh, Again, I think the president has given numerous different uh, times he's talked about this provision. Um, and uh, again, as ATF director, what comes, what Congress passes is what we deal with. And we don't do civil okay, litigation so, in that sense. So you anyway. do, you, that's not under if our... that's true and you're going to do what Congress says, then obviously you don't agree with the president. I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but that's, that's what that means. Uh, I think the president has called on Congress to act. And what I'm saying is, just, just answer director, this question. I take what as up. you interpret the statute, I assume you're familiar with the statute. Uh, I'm familiar with the statute, but ATF doesn't do civil uh, uh, litigation I, I know, liability I know in that, that sense. It's not I, I, yes, sir, I know, but you're the director of ATF. You're familiar, for example, that vaccine manufacturers have uh, some liability exemption for their COVID vaccines, right? I, I actually am not familiar with vaccine well, okay. law. okay. Most so. Americans are. Big tech companies are exempt from liability due to Section 230. You have any familiarity with that? Uh, I've obviously, as probably who reads the news, I know about the, that. The, but point is, not... the point is the president has grossly overstated what this statute does. And since you're not familiar with the statute, apparently, let me tell you that um, some of the exemptions, the limited exemptions, are negligence, knowingly selling to somebody who's not allowed to have a firearm, uh, knowingly making false records, that kind of thing. It is not a blanket immunity, and we need you to be clear about that because the president, intentionally or unintentionally, is misleading the public on it. Let me move to something else. The stabilizing brace rule, as finalized this year, is about set to go into effect in the 1st of June. There's been some discussion about it this morning, but I think most of the American people are not yet aware because the mainstream media is not covering this issue. But here's the facts. Due to ATF's unilateral and unconstitutional action, okay, if you own a stabilizing brace, you're required to register it with ATF, turn it in or destroy it by May 31st, or you're gonna face criminal penalties. Mr. Dettelbeck, as an attorney, I'm assuming you know what a reliance interest is, right? Familiar with the term? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm in agreement with your characterization. Do of you the know the term and... reliance interest? I'm not playing games here. I'm not trying to either. I'm trying to be respectful. I, I'm in disagreement with your summary of what the... I haven't summarized it yet. I'm asking you if you know the term. 
Uh, about what you said, I'm sorry. About what is a re what is a reliance interest? You were a federal prosecutor. Okay, What's a so, reliance? So, well, we don't use it in federal prosecution, but from being a lawyer, mm -hmm. reliance generally, I think, from my days in contracts and as a and as a civil litigator, uh, re refers to the idea that in contract law, when somebody uh, relies to their detriment on certain kinds of uh, matters, that they have some legal claims that they might not otherwise have. Excellent. It's not just confined to contract law, but um, as a lawyer and knowing that definition, knowing the concept, I mean, does it concern you that for years law-abiding Americans relied on the ATF's guidance in purchasing stabilizing braces and now due to a regulation, not a law passed by Congress, but a regulation, millions of them are going to suddenly become felons? Um, first of all, the law doesn't either uh, ban anything nor, uh, the, the, nor uh, does the rule apply to all stabilizing braces. Uh, the rule under the National Firearms Act uh, helps define uh, and clarify what the characteristics of a firearm okay, right, that would but be with a short your rifle. With your clarification, is it true or not that millions of Americans will be defined as felons after May 31 if they don't follow this new regulation? True or not? Uh, I assume that people are going to either detach the weapons, follow the things. If they don't the follow the regulation, they'll be a felon, right? You're you're a former I, I, federal prosecutor. Yeah, I, and 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 yeah. I, and I and I will tell you that uh, that federal prosecutions do not happen with respect to law-abiding people who can't have a criminal intent okay, established. Okay. Uh, that that is not a priority. Okay, here's here's the problem we have. But, here's the problem we have. Okay, you ran for Ohio Attorney General in 2018. Your platform included gun control. We know where you stand, right? Mm -hmm. As, as recently as 10 minutes ago, Ms. Jackson Lee, you couldn't answer or define what an, a so-called assault weapon is. You continue to not be able to do that or refuse to do it. Uh, it's clear that you came to ATF with an agenda, I believe, to infringe upon good law-abiding Americans' rights, and you're going to turn them into criminals with this regulation, and you seem to have no remorse about it. I'm out of time, and I yield back. Uh, with respect to... You know, yields, I didn't ask sorry. you a question. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the, the other Mr. Johnson from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the uh, folks from Demand, Moms Demand Action uh, for showing up today uh, in their red uh, T-shirts with Moms Demand Action on them. And they are not just sprinkled, but they're dominating the uh, audience out here. So your presence is notable. Thank you all for coming. Give me the uh, money. Uh, Director Dettelback, uh, you're the first permanent director of the ATF since 2015, uh, almost eight years ago. Isn't that correct? The first presidentially appointed Senate confirmed director, yes. And you didn't get a single Republican vote during your confirmation process, did you? Uh, that's actually not correct. <laughs> uh, you might have gotten one. Uh, I, think, I think I received uh, uh, two votes. Two votes. For my Just confirmation from two votes. senators. Yeah. And, um, and tell me this, sir, you've heard of the MAGA Republican calls to defund the ATF, have you not? Uh, I, I have obviously heard of calls uh, and, and, to and, defund and, law enforcement and, and, and defund and, ATF. I, and, I and let not... me ask you this, sir. Let me ask you this. The major functions of the ATF are to reduce the risk of the risk to public safety caused by illegal firearms trafficking, okay. correct? It's to get shooters off the street and cut off the unlawful throw uh, firearms that support that enable them to kill people. And also a function of the uh, ATF, a major function is to reduce the risk to public safety caused by criminal possession and use of firearms, correct? That's also one of the things we work on, yes. And you improve public safety by increasing compliance with federal laws and regulations by firearms industry members, correct? That's what Congress has uh, tasked us with doing. Sir, you are aware of the fact that gun violence is on the increase in this country, correct? Uh, the gun violence problem is very significant all over this country. What would be the impact of the MAGA Republican plan to defund the ATF? Uh, it, would, uh, it would have a negative impact on public safety. It would make us less safe. I it? believe that's correct, and it would make it harder for state and local law enforcement uh, to work together with us on violent crime. And we wouldn't be there for, to help Because them. it's a holistic system with the federal, state, and local governments acting in concert to keep us all safe. Isn't that correct? Since I started this uh, business in 1991, that is the single most positive development in law enforcement is those collaborations that exist now 
regardless of administration between federal, state, and local law enforcement every day. Would it be fair to say, sir, that the MAGA Republican plan to defund and abolish the ATF would lead to increased gun violence? Um, defunding the ATF would make it easier for people to get away with killing people, hurting people with guns, and it would make it easier for them to unlawfully obtain firearms to do that. Tell me this, sir. Republicans have blocked the confirmation of an ATF director since 2015. What impact has that had on gun violence in this country? Um, uh, respectfully, I'm, I'm director of a law enforcement agency. It's very hard for me to estimate uh, the, the sort of the the idea of what political differences it's, have. Yeah, but it's had, a, it's had a negative impact, hasn't it? The fact that the ATF has I, gone without a director since I, 2015. They had an uh, acting. I, I believe that in, in the name of good government, that regardless of which party is in the White House, that we should have confirmed directors of ATF. That is my, that is, that is my belief. So, sir, the ATF plays a critical role in protecting communities from gun violence and ensuring the safe dealing of and access to firearms by law-abiding Americans. Isn't that correct? We protect public safety, and we must respect uh, the Constitution, of course. Now, why would it be that Republicans would uh, seek to uh, abolish the ATF? Could it be because they want guns to continue to be unregulated in American society? They want to see the wild, wild west uh, continue, but this time not with six shooters, but with uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction in the hands of unfit individuals uh, in our country? At ATF, what we work on, of course, is public safety. Um, I don't know the motivation of others. I start, that's why I came to this job, is to work with people to try to address problems. I start from the point of view that everybody can agree no matter what their views are, that we can do more to protect people from violent crime. Many people may have passionate differences on how to do that. That's for Congress to decide. But I do start from the notion that people want to, to make our country safer. Well, I thank you for your service, sir, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Florida is recognized. <clears throat> how many guns has the ATF lost? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> uh, is it a difficult question to understand? Uh, well, I, I, I don't know if you're referring to uh, any particular incident or time How many period. instances should we be looking at where you've lost guns? Um, so if, if what you're referring to is what happened at the National Destruction Branch, no guns were lost. They were stolen by an individual who's now in prison. Right. Uh, who was right. not an but, ATF employee. But there were recommendations made on what you should do so that you don't become the victim of the theft and the Inspector General saying you're not following them. I'm quoting directly from the Inspector General's report. Thousands of firearms, firearms, parts, and ammunition had been stolen from the ATF. So you gave testimony that the brave ATF agents are the ones showing up at two in the morning after a burglary, but it seems as though in this case, you were the one burglarized. <laughs> Why have you not followed the recommendations of the, of the Office of Inspector General so that you aren't the mark? Um, Again, uh, it is, it, I, I want to say that it is a brave women of, of a, men and women of ATF who do do this. That's not a, a well, I know what they're doing. I know what they're doing. They're day. getting robbed on one hand, so you can't keep a hold of the guns you're supposed to have, but then you do keep a hold of a bunch of stuff you're not supposed to have a hold of. We, the GAO report, firearms data, ATF did not always comply with the Appropriations Act restriction and should better adhere to its policies. As a result of breaking the law, didn't you guys have to go and delete like a quarter of a million records that you illegally kept? Uh, again, uh, with respect to both the Inspector General reports that you're talking nope, about. One's Inspector we, General, one's GAO. Well, the, GA, the, the, yep. the, the, the Inspector General report uh, ATF that happened uh, several years ago, more than that. 2022. And ATF, and ATF the has, the, the report, report came out, but the theft, and yeah. ATF has implemented uh, numerous different safety measures with respect to the national uh, destructive branch. Well, I mean, he, I'm, I'm reading safeguard. to you from the report from last year, Mr. Director. We found that the NDB staff does not currently 
currently in 2022, adhere to established operating procedures in place to mitigate risk of firearms being lost and stolen. So I guess I, th that shows an ATF that is not functioning correctly and is not responding to the problems you create. You keep records you're not supposed to. It was a quarter million of them you had to delete, right? Um, I, I don't believe that that is um, Was it over 200,000 that you had to delete? Uh, so what, what, what was happening was... I just want to know the number of records you had to delete that were not being lawfully, lawfully maintained. There were, there were records that were, had not actually been searched, but my understanding Hundreds of is thousands were searchable. Of them. And so that's what you guys do. You keep what you shouldn't keep. You lose what you're not supposed to lose. But how do you treat regular Americans? I got this letter from someone in my district, uh, a firearms dealer. I have been a firearms dealer for 46 years. For 46 years, I've had a good relationship with law enforcement. Then came the ATF's zero tolerance policy. Two years ago, while in the process of selling a firearm to a customer, I completed their background check using Florida's FDLE firearm purchasing program. The background check was uneventful, and FDLE rendered an approval number. Some months later, during an ATF audit, I was told the background check was now a non-approval. Even though FDLE made the error, it was on my paperwork, so ATF deemed it a willful error. After completing close to 50,000 background checks over 46 years, why would I willfully ignore this background check? The answer is simple. I did not. But the ATF has revoked my license, ended my career, and my livelihood. So I guess the question is, why should you be able to destroy the life of one of my constituents over a technicality where they weren't even at fault when you all lose thousands of guns and illegally keep hundreds of thousands of records? Respectfully, uh, with res Congress has, has given us uh, the authority to inspect and make sure that firearms dealers, the vast majority by the which are compliant, they are our first line of defense. Um, in, in dealing with uh, straw purchases. This guy isn't your first line of defense anymore. He's fired. But a very small uh, minority, those dealers, uh, after due process, uh, have a been A small determined. minority, a small minority. ATF, enforcer of gun laws, lost thousands of firearm parts to thieves. New data shows ATF gun store restrictions at the highest rate in 16 years. Mr. Director, the definition of hypocrisy is when you can't live up to your own standard. So you have imposed a zero tolerance policy that is resulting in the highest rate of revocations in 16 years, and you wouldn't be able to meet your own zero tolerance policy because you lose stuff you're supposed to keep, and then you keep stuff that it's illegal to keep. Uh, and by the way, I am one of those MAGA Republicans that would defund your salary, your agency, and I, don't, I, and I think all these good things that you say exist could happen with those folks at the local and state level, and this is a, is a terrible abuse of power. Um, Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, thank you. Well, we can see now what the GOP has become. It's become the anti-ATF, anti-FBI, anti-law enforcement, uh, pro-insurrection party. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Director, I appreciate your being here. You have one of the toughest jobs in America. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle treat you like you're some kind of a mass shooter instead of someone trying to protect us from the epidemic of gun violence. And I want to recognize all of the volunteers from Moms and Man Action and thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for your advocacy around the nation. Um, I appreciate how much you're devoted to trying to end this scourge of gun violence. Soon. Um, I thought, I think like many Americans, that after the tragedy of Sandy Hook, it would finally be enough. Watching those beautiful children massacred would be finally enough to prompt this Congress to do something, to stop this insanity. But it didn't. Uh, tragically, so many members of Congress learned a very different lesson that they could just wait it out. They could wait out tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And they would have to do nothing. Uh, and indeed, on the other side of the aisle, it's just gotten worse. It's just gotten worse. Whenever you see a disparity between what the American people want and what they get, there's usually a powerful special interest uh, at work. And here, the American people desperately want an end to this epidemic. They want 
common sense gun safety legislation. They want to ban on assault weapons. They want truly universal background checks. It, it's insane that you can be denied the purchase of a weapon because you're a felon and then go out in the parking lot and buy the same gun. That is insane. And of course, we see the result when we see our children mowed down week after week after week. And it's not like there aren't answers to this. It's not like there aren't things that work. There are things that work, like abandoned assault weapons and abandoned high-capacity clips. And yes, it won't stop every shooting, it won't stop every mass shooting, but it'll stop a lot of them, and it makes the ones that happen far less lethal. I mean, the GOP has become the party of wanting Freedom. guns with more lethality, capable of killing more people, capable of killing more kids and more cops. And I'm sure they don't actually want cops and kids to die, but it's the effect of their actions, it's the effect of their inaction that people are dying. I mean, not even NRA members want this. And so why, uh, why do they, who benefits from this? Who benefits from this, this, this absurd, grotesque spectacle of, of mass shootings week after week and the daily trauma of people getting gunned down? Who benefits? Certainly not the American people. Well, the gun makers benefit. It's all about the money. Apparently it's all about the money. Nothing else matters. I've been carrying a bill now for, for six or eight years to repeal the immunity that the gun industry has. Because if it's all about the money, then the only thing that will, will stop the violence is to take away the money, take away the profit in murder. So I, I'm grateful to, to Mama's Demand Action. I'm grateful for what you're doing out there. You're making a difference. If not in this building, you're making a difference in state capitals. I think you're gonna make a difference in this building. We will get to a tipping point where we will show that we can, we can beat the NRA, we can pass common sense reforms, and we can protect the public. Oh, I don't want your protection, bitch. You know, there, there has been a lot of progress, I think, on the Democratic side of the aisle of, of members running towards this issue, not away from it. But on the other side of the aisle, after that terrible shooting in Buffalo, for example, a year or two ago, when one of the Republican members said they could no longer in good conscience oppose an assault weapons ban, it was a few days later they were forced to announce that they would not run again because they were told basically that they would be drummed out of the party. And that has got to change. We're just going to see more Americans die from the lack of courage in this building. But I, I am just so fed up with getting up every day and seeing another city devastated, another town, another school known not for the beauty of its people, but for the deadliness of another tragedy. You've got to do better than this. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognize himself for five minutes. Mr. Dettelbach, are, are you troubled by the rule? I mean, you told him one thing 10 years ago, and now you're directly contradicting that. Uh, the, the, uh, stabil the stabilizing brake short barrel rifle rule, I assume, is the rule you're, you're referring I'm, to. I'm referring to the letter that was sent back on November 26, 2012, that Mr. Nell's referenced in his first line of questioning, where sure. you, told, so, you uh, told the FTB finds that the submitted brace, when attached to a forearm, excuse me, a firearm, does not convert the weapon and would not alter its classification. Uh, now you're doing we, just, we, just the opposite. We have been, we have been public and in the rulemaking itself have detailed that history and there were inconsistencies. However, there was also a situation, Mr. Chairman, where people were marketing products that had never been presented to ATF saying that they were Was ATF that the approved. only time you told them, the only time you told the American people that it was okay? No, we, we look at specific well, let me read, products let me read this that Let me read this letter, March 5th, 2014, because this doesn't so much focus on the brace, Focus on how the weapons used that we have determined that firing a pistol from the shoulder would not cause the pistol to be reclassified as a short barrel rifle. We do not classify weapons based on how individuals use the weapon. So you told them not once, but twice that it was okay. And I'm just asking, does it bother you now that you are doing, you're making the change that's going to impact millions of Americans? The rule was necessary in part because it needed to address inconsistency so that people could understand the definition of a short I just read two life. letters that were consistent. Both of them there, said it was fine. There were other letters 
that were not. Have you ever found, has ATF ever found itself in this position where a rule change directly contradicts what you've told American citizens was okay, and that's going to impact millions, millions of law-abiding citizens? Have you ever found yourself in that situation? Uh, respectfully, I don't believe that's the, the uh, uh, I agree millions with that of summary of where Millions we are, of Americans aren't going to be were, impacted? There, no, there were specific products that get presented for classification. Those products then sometimes change. They're not the same ones that are marketed. A and there was, I, there was inconsistency. The market is dynamic. It was necessary to do what it, notice and comment rulemaking, I think, is a I think better millions way to of do Americans that. think the inconsistency is with the ATF because you told them one thing and now you're changing. What happens on May 31st? Oh, on, um, according to the rule. Now, what happens on May 31st? According to the rule, people have, from the date the rule was, was published until that date, uh, to, to do one of several things. They can either detach the brace from the firearm and keep both, uh, uh, and they can attach that How about brace this? to another one. They got to remove or destroy the brace, get a longer barrel, turn in or destroy the firearm, or register the firearm. Is that right? They got to do the, one they of those four things. They have to apply to register whether or not the application is ruled on. They're allowed to keep the, the, the item during that entire time so that they're not uh, held if accountable. If they don't for do that period. and the timeline runs out, what happens to those individuals? They, know, they don't do those four things and the timeline has expired. What happens well, then? I, I assume that people who uh, are no, aware- I'm not asking what, what happens if they don't do those well, four things. Well, I, I think that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as a prosecutor, I, I just want to be accurate. What happens, a former prosecutor, what happens is Depending on the circumstance, if a person is unaware, right, they, they're not going to be prosecuted for things that let's they're cut, unaware let's cut to the chase. of. They could be a felon, right? Well, they could be it, a felon. It, it depends on the facts and circumstances of each case. And of course, we would prioritize enforcement on gang members who are having these How items are you? and you shooting people. Enforcement. How are you going to enforce this? Uh, we're going to go to gun ranges? What we will do is going to go to manufacturers always... and look at the risk of people they sold braces to. <laughs> what we will what we will do is we will when we do a search warrant in a drug case and we discover an unlawful item, whether it's a machine gun or a Glock switch or a short barreled rifle that doesn't comply, we will consider that as one of the charges. There's no plan. Does the gun to, does to the Gun Control Act or the National Firearms Act clearly and unambiguously prohibit pistol braces? Uh, okay. It doesn't prohibit anything. It calls for increased controls on short-barreled rifles. Not the gun control, but I'm just reading from the court decision yesterday in the Sixth Circuit where the, the, the judge oh, said the statute does not clearly and unambiguously prohibit bump stocks. The court went on to say for a decade the ATF has maintained that a bump stock is not a machine gun part, and the court said the ATF's own flip-flop on this position is one of the reasons why they ruled in favor of those opposing the rule you guys made. Seems to me we're in the same situation here. And yesterday the Sixth Circuit gave us a strong ruling on the bump stock issue. I would anticipate that we're gonna get other strong rulings on this issue as well. With that, the Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's interesting that my Republican colleagues are concerned about um, how we enforce things when most of the bills we've been voting on in this session are completely unworkable. Um, just last week, Republicans held a 12-hour markup on a cruel immigration bill aimed at what they're calling the, quote, crisis at the border. But we haven't done anything in this committee to actually meaningfully address the issues at hand. And one major push factor is violence in the region, which is fueled by American firearms. The United States is the number one source of semi-automatic weapons in El Salvador. About half a million guns are trafficked to Mexico from the U.S. every year and 70 to 90 percent of guns recovered at crime scenes in Mexico are traced back to the United States. So the crisis of gun violence in the United States and our lack of gun regulations is spreading to other countries. That is the real crisis at our borders. Director Dettelbach, thank you for being here. These gun trafficking numbers are alarming and the ATF plays a vital role in tracing and recovering guns that are used in crimes to fight the proliferation proliferation of gun violence and gun trafficking. From 2017 to 2021, the ATF traced close to 2 million guns in crimes, and yet some of my Republican colleagues actually want to eliminate the ATF. So 
how does the ATF currently fight gun trafficking, especially trafficking to Mexico and other countries to the south of us? Um, in, in trying to effectualize our public safety mission, as a small agency with a big job, uh, we try to bring tools to that. And, and the two tools that we bring to the problems you're talking about are partnership with our state and local law enforcement and crime gun intelligence. What crime gun intelligence, whether that's our tracing ability for crime guns, or whether it's the NIBIN system to connect crimes together where a common firearm is used, can do, is it can enable us to try to identify where the crime guns are coming from, how they're moving from lawful commerce into the black market under unlawful commerce, and target our resources to do that. That's not limited to, but it certainly in includes uh, gun traffic that flows uh, south over the border. We have at ATF uh, a group of firearms trafficking strike forces, uh, task forces, I'm sorry, that are focused on the southwest border. And every day we are working to try to interdict the flow of firearms unlawfully uh, from commerce to south, including to places like the cartels. So eliminating the ATF would have enormous consequences for that work. The Bipartisan Safer Communities Act contained the Stop Illegal Trafficking in Firearms Act, which made it an explicit federal crime to act as a straw purchaser for firearms and establishes penalties for those transferring a firearm they have reason to believe will be used in a crime. The ATF's work recently led to the first gun trafficking conviction under the new law this February. How would repeal of that law or defunding of the ATF, including the anti-firearms trafficking campaign, as proposed by Republicans, impact gun trafficking? Uh, Congress passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, and as you say, they gave us not one but two new criminal statutes, uh, a straw purchasing statute for the first time ever, a standalone, and a firearms trafficking uh, felony. We are working with state and local law enforcement every day to bring those cases. We've brought, uh, I think, over 30, including the one that you referred to yeah. in Texas, 231 firearms being trafficked south of the border. Um, and these cases take time and effort and expertise to investigate. And so to implement those, those laws, to, to enforce them, ATF needs to have the resources uh, to be able to do those investigations, to follow through, and, and to take people who are criminals supplying crime guns, uh, not the law-abiding law citizens, but supplying crime guns to criminals uh, and take them out of that, that business. Thank you for that work. The second volume of National Firearms Commerce and Trafficking Assessment found that over one million guns were stolen from private residences from 2017 to 2021, and that these stolen guns make up a substantial portion of guns that are eventually trafficked and used in crimes. I have proposed the Safe Gun Storage Act, which requires strong standards for firearm storage devices to protect, prevent unintended use and theft, but sadly, my colleagues across the aisle oppose even this sensible gun safety measure. Could safe gun storage or other common sense gun legislation stop the large flow of firearms across the United States borders into other countries or at least substantially help with that issue? Um, I talk about the issue of uh, safe storage uh, often. And uh, the way I try to communicate, because I think this is something we can have consensus on, is that there is a right to bear arms in this country, but people should understand there's no a responsibility to That's safely right. secure your firearm. And it means a lot to you. It's an important right. So why wouldn't you try to secure it? Firearms that are stolen from cars and parking lots at malls are not used to hunt or for self-protection. They end up at crime scenes in the next community or in your community to hurt people. I would just encourage everybody uh, to do what your local police chief, sheriff, ATF, SAC says, which is please think ahead and just act responsibly and secure your firearms. It's what everybody wants, and real people in our communities are getting hurt by, by just carelessness. Thank you. Uh, the gentlelady has expired. Uh, gentlelady, you'll be back. Gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Uh, Director Dettelbach, I am so glad you finished up talking when you're talking about stolen weapons. When weapons get in the bad guy's hands, they're stolen from some group. We already had Mr. Gates talk about the weapons that were stolen from you. But let's just talk about it. I, I know you thought Fast and Furious was over with. It's not over. It's not over. There's a, there's a, a licensed FFL that I am aware of that sold a weapon during that Fast and Furious time. Who did he sell it to? To ATF. Guess what? 
it was recently traced to a crime. Guess who's got to respond to that? The FFL. It was ATF that ran fast and furious. 2,000 guns. 2,000 guns. And this one recently turned up in a crime. And now you're coming back to the FFL saying, well, hey, hey, who'd you sell it to? Well, I sold it to an ATF agent. Where did it go? Well, you guys had guns stolen from you. So I want to know this. How many other guns from Operation Fast and Furious remain unaccounted for? Uh, so op Operation Fast and Furious has been the subject of numerous it's, it's, reports. It's, 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 and I do not, I do not have. So, so you don't know. Just I say, don't have the specific answer. I can get back to you if there's if there's sources. You don't. Information you don't know because there were over two thousand guns. Last report that was published was that you'd recovered seven hundred of them. Mexico reported a hundred and fifty people killed or maimed with guns that ATF had. The Fast and Furious. That's what the radical left Democrats thought was a great program. So don't elaborate and try to say, oh, hey, guess what? You know what? I can get you numbers. I would like those numbers. Because I also want to know this. How many guns walked away altogether from ATF? Not yet. Uh, since Fast and Furious. During and, Fast and Furious. Uh, Fast and Furious, which was, I think, 15 years ago, there were reports I can check and get back to you with the public record, but we have implemented numerous controls to try and make sure that we're respecting but just, but, public but, safety. But, but, the, but, the, but what happened earlier today, it was just reported this year, the, the IG said that you still haven't Im implemented enough uh, uh, reforms, guidelines to watch over to make sure. You were the victim of, of how many guns were stolen from you guys? Uh, most of the items that were stolen from the National Destruction Branch, which is what I think you're referring to, were yeah. parts, were firearm components. Um, so is there that, were some so that's, number of firearms that were also So stolen. you're not going to tell us the number? And uh, I don't know, sitting here, the exact number of complete How many guns from Fast and stolen? Furious were recovered at crime scenes? Uh, again, uh, I don't want to... How many to FFLs speak. are you, at, you uh, inspecting today because they sold to ATF during Fast and Furious. Do you know that? I, I don't believe we're inspecting any FFLs today. Well, sure you are. Any, sure you are. Because, of, because I've had Please allow me to finish. Because of any conduct that relates in any way, shape, or form to Fast and Furious. Well, sure you are. Because I know. Because an FFL contacted me and showed me the docs. You guys are inspecting and going after an FFL who sold to ATF. I thought, I'm sorry if I misunderstood. I thought your question was, uh, are we inspecting people because of conduct in Fast and Furious? It would be 15 years since it would be normal, right, which the is normal what, course of business to inspect a federal licensed firearms dealer sure. once but, but a decade. The, but the problem that we have here, and this is just, this is just one of many FFLs that, have, that are undergoing rigorous problems from you guys, from you guys. This is an FFL that's sold to an ATF agent. The ATF lost, lost uh, track of that weapon and gets used in a crime, and now he's having to respond. Why isn't ATF having to respond? Because it gets back to the hypocrisy of your zero tolerance policy. You guys can't live up to your own requirements and guidelines, but you're gonna go after FFLs. How about this one? We have a case where a customer of an FFL who's an American citizen of Armenian descent visited by ATF agents seeking information about his legal firearm purchases. When asked why they wanted to know about his firearm purchases, agents told him that it was because he was born in Iran and had purchased multiple firearms from that FFL. Think about that. How about this one? A different FFL. They have video cameras everywhere. They have one room. The ATF inspector goes in, takes the, the documents with him, and on their personal phone starts taking pictures of all the documents. Personal, personal phone. Is that normal? Is that normal to use your personal phone? Um, again, I'm not... I'm not familiar with the facts and circumstances of that Is that normal? Matter, Is that but, part of you guys? But, but uh, we conduct our inspections pursuant to a procedure. It is a public procedure, and we follow that procedure in conducting those. Including personal, pro, personal phones of, the, of your inspectors. Time of the gentleman. Time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from uh, California for five minutes. Mm -hmm. Director. Okay. Watch this stuff. Director, right over here. Is a small well? Director, our kids are dying. Yep. They're dying in their schools. They're dying in their communities. And if they're not dying 
they're drilling. Every day in America, kids are going through traumatizing mass shooter drills. And so it's just maddening to me that this committee, as our kids are dying, with the responsibility of protecting our kids, the greatest resource in our community, uh, that they would bring you here and attack you, whose job is to protect our kids. I, I, th I look at this as very binary. You can protect your home, you can take your kids hunting, you can shoot for sport, but if you're not on the side of protecting our kids, you're on the side of helping their killers. That's it. You either can help the kids or help the killers. But I also fear that this rhetoric from my colleagues is putting targets on the backs of law enforcement. Director Delabach, have you seen increased threats over the years uh, to your agents and just federal law enforcement in general? It is my deepest honor to be here representing the brave men and women, the career people who work at ATF every day. And what I will say is that I, attacks on a, a political appointee, I, under, I understand, unfortunately, it's just become part of our, our country, but uh, I would, it, I would say those men and women who are out there doing their job, risking their lives to try to protect people in law enforcement, in all of these functions at ATF, uh, they deserve our respect and support. It is the greatest honor of my professional life uh, to be able to sit here and say, call them colleagues, because they're incredibly brave, dedicated people. And they're not people who have been all personally involved, right? They're there because they care. That's the same with our state and local law enforcement partners. And when they're attacked by political leaders, does it, make it hard, does it make it easier or harder for you to recruit people to go into law enforcement to protect our communities? I, I think, you know, uh, it's no uh, surprise that it is, uh, it is difficult to, it's a very difficult and dangerous job to start with. And uh, it is more difficult to recruit people and retain people now than ever. Um, and so I just think as a country, uh, we can try to support the brave work that these career people are doing while having our disagreements about, about things we feel passionately about. I was raised by a cop, two Republican uh, parents, and they were a pro-police party, but I fear that that is no longer the case. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, one of our colleagues, uh, campaigns and raises money on a defund the FBI platform. Chip Roy on this committee has often said we need to defund the border and, and the police who are at the border. Uh, Mr. Massey on this committee has called for defunding the ATF. The chairman of this committee, Jim Jordan, recently said in a TV interview that he wants to defund the FBI and the Department of Justice. And this committee's chairman had, before this committee, in just the last 45 days, a witness who said, F cops. When you're the chairman, you can call anyone who walks this earth as a witness. And they called somebody who had recently tweeted this year, F cops. So Mr. Dettelbach, I fear that they continue to put a target on the backs of good, honest working cops who walk the beats in our community. And I share your concern with that. I also wanna ask you if it would surprise you to learn that JAMA Network, which is a medical journal, recently estimated that the economic consequences of gun violence in our community is $557 billion a year. That takes into account police investigations, medical treatment, long-term physical and mental health care, earnings loss to disability or death, criminal justice costs, pain and suffering, and that is equal to 2.6% of America's gross domestic budget, five times the budget of the Department of Education, I hope that eye-popping number, if kids dying in our classroom doesn't get the attention of my colleagues, I hope money will talk to them. But does it surprise you to learn that that's the estimate, $557 billion a year? Uh, I don't know about the particular numbers. I know, obviously, violent crime costs our society in many ways. It costs a, a physical, a psychological, uh, community, medical, and financial toll. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Massey is recognized. This is going to be good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Director, in 2012, John Spencer, Chief of Firearms Technology Branch, wrote a letter to Alex Bosco, inventor of Stabilizing Brace. We talked about this letter already. He, he said, based on our evaluation, FTB finds that the submitted firearm brace, when attached to a firearm, does not convert that weapon to be fired from the shoulder and would not alter the classification of a pistol or other firearm. You're aware of this letter? 
I, I am aware of the letter, did, yes. Did Congress pass, uh, between this letter being issued to Mr. Bosco and the, and the production and distribution of 10 to 40 million of these braces and the implementation of your rule, did Congress pass a law? What changed? Uh, Congress did not pass a law, but something did change. What changed is that, that that item that was submitted was not produced and was not the item that was marketed. And Mr. Bosco, I think, before this committee said that people were using stabilizing braces in ways that he hadn't anticipated. Okay, so let, me, the market, right, let, me, let, me, let me challenge that assertion. So you say that the brace changed, and so you had to implement this uh, rule. Well, I, I've got here the actual original brace that this letter was responsive to. Are you telling me that this brace is exempt from your rule? Uh, what I'm saying is, is that if people have products that are not is designed- Is this brace and, and exempt from your rule? I, 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 I can't sit here and classify- This is the brace you wrote the letter to. classification, and if it's not a rule to be attached as a short-barreled rifle, it will not okay. be subject to the rule. Can I get, could, would you please quit telling this committee that the brace has changed and that's why you did the rule when in fact, you're not exempting the, the same brace that you gave this letter to. If the brace is submitted, we'll classify it. Would with you a, submit, would you, do you still have the same agreement that this brace that you, that the ATF agreed to in 2012 should not be under the jurisdiction of your rule? If that brace is submitted with a firearm, we will examine and classify it. If it doesn't okay, qualify- Okay, reclaiming my time, uh, because it's pretty obvious you're misleading people here when you say that the brace has changed, because your rule affects the braces that didn't change. How many days have passed? How many days do people have to comply with this rule? Um, so uh, they can always comply, but the, the but initial period- Before they're felons? But the initial period, uh, I believe, uh, ends at the end of May. Okay, but, but people end of are, May. So we're and it was 120 days. Is that correct? People are only felons if they intentionally. Is it 120 days? The law. Uh, I believe it's 120 days from. So the we've got 36 days left of the 120 day grace period. Can you tell us here today how many people have complied by registering this product? Uh, I am not sure of the exact number. I can check, though, and get back to you. Uh, there are people who are making applications. There also can be detachment. So in other are words, we don't count. We don't, it, that's not for us to regulate. If somebody simply, we wrote the rule to make it easy to comply with. If somebody just at their home detaches the weapon from the brace and keeps them apart, uh, they do not have to register anything. They can keep the brace. They can keep the business end of the gun. Okay, that, that's a great clarification. So you're not going to do some kind of constructive uh, prosecution where you say, oh, well, you had this and you had that and you intended to connect they're keeping them. The, I mean, they, they can just keep them separately. them as we as Keep we them separately. Them, but okay, and, because and, that's and, not clear in your rules. Um, and and it, how, what is the punishment if somebody is uh, convicted as a felon under having this piece of plastic? On, uh, if people are convicted of not finding the Gun Control Act, uh, it's a serious felony conviction, ten, but, is but it that ten requires years? intent. Is it, can you just give me the number? Is it 10 years? Uh, I, I don't, I believe it's a statutory maximum of 10 years. I had 10 I'll, years for owning a piece of plastic hmm. the, the, that was that you were told was legal and that you owned for a decade and that millions of people did. This is what offends the sensibilities of Americans, whether they own these or not. Do these, do these make the gun fire more rapidly? Uh, the, 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 uh, the stabilizing Do these braces, increase the muzzle velocity? The stabilizing Do these allow the, you're not answering any of the questions. Do these allow the firearm to carry more uh, bullets? The stabilizing rounds? braces allow, if they're, if they're the kind that count, allow the firearm to be shouldered let me ask in you ways this. that Congress I'm glad, I'm glad you brought it. that up. So this is a stabilizing brace here. Here's a pistol without a stabilizing brace. Does the buffer tube, could that be shouldered? Uh, again, I, I, that would have to be submitted to the firearms experts at ATF, and we could classify it. Do you, do you it, think you have do? the authority to class, reclassify this pistol as a short-barreled rifle simply because it has a buffer tube? Uh, again, the rule is aimed at clarifying, and there are specific factors this, that are set forth in the rule. Do you think which, you have the authority to reclassify the firearm above because it can be shouldered? Uh, again, uh, for me to sit here and try to do a classification that firearms experts who've worked for decades do would not be appropriate. But we will 
give classifications. And if things don't qualify under the rule, then they don't qualify. And nobody, the piece of plastic in and of itself is absolutely I not submit you don't have rule. that authority and you don't have the authority to do what you did. I yield back. The gentleman yields. Next, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Sicily. Oh, Thank you, Mr. Go. Chairman. To use uh, the chairman's words, you know what Americans can't stand? You know what they hate about this town? They can't stand gun violence, and they can't stand the fact that the Judiciary Committee has done nothing about it. That's what they really can't stand. We're not here to talk about guns in the way most of us hope we would, that 40,000 Americans' lives each year are lost to gun violence, or how gun violence has become the leading cause of death of children in America, even passing car accidents, or how we've had more than 170 mass shootings this year already, or how our kids are being gunned down by assault weapons in schools again and again and again. No. Instead, Republicans have convened today's hearing to attack the agency devoted to preventing gun violence and to try to decimate its ability to keep Americans safe. During last week's vote to dismantle the ATF rule in this committee, my colleague Mr. Ivey posed a simple question. What are you willing to do to address gun violence? Anything? Is there any measure you'll work on to help curb this epidemic in this country? Anything at all? I think we have our answer. We should be talking about how we support the ATF and enable it to do its job. But today, again, we're here to attack the ATF and to try to even abolish it. So, Director Delbeck, I want to first say thank you for your service and to the brave men and women who serve at ATF. I apologize for the manner in which you have been treated in this hearing, but I hope you understand they're not actually interested in having an answer from you. This is about making a speech and having a video clip and sending it to Fox or maybe raising money off it. So please don't feel badly that you're actually not being allowed to answer a question. So I'm going to actually ask questions and I'd love your answers. I want to talk a little bit about how the ATF enforces laws that Congress passes and adapts to new technologies and innovations. Nearly 90 years ago, Congress passed the National Firearms Act of 1934, uh, the first federal law regulating firearms in the United States. And as part of this law, Congress expressly regulated certain firearms and accessories because they were particularly dangerous. Americans were free to purchase them, but they had to undergo a background check, submit their photograph and fingerprints, and pay a $200 transfer fee. Today, we live in an age of 3D printers, automatic milling machines, plastics, and carbon fiber. Part of the National Firearms Act covers machine guns, guns that fire repeatedly with one pull of a trigger. We actually banned the civilian manufacturer and sale of new machine guns in the 1980s, so there's only a finite amount of legal ones in the U.S. So, Director, my first question is, can you tell me uh, what a Glock switch is? Um, yes, a Glock switch, um, is, Congressman, is a, is a device that can be a, attached. It's usually a small piece of plastic or metal that can be attached to a pistol that changes it from a lawful semi-automatic weapon into uh, a new and unlawful machine gun. Into a fully automatic. So this is a device that can be attached to a legally purchased pistol, transforming the character of the gun, turning it into an illegal machine gun. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, that is. And you can get these for other types of guns, too. For example, the AR-15. Uh, there are machine gun conversion devices uh, that go with a variety of different... Yeah, okay, I'm trying to get through weapons. these quickly, so that's a yes. And the ATF regulates Glock switches in the same way as it regulates machine guns themselves. Isn't that correct? Uh, those devices are unlawful under the National Firearms Act. So the answer is yes. Yes. So they're, okay, they're, and that's because within a few minutes' time, these devices, just a few ounces of metal or plastic, when added to a legally purchased gun, turn it into an illegal machine gun, correct? Already illegal, guys. That's correct. And, Director, the NFA also covers short barrel rifles, does it not? Yes. And the reason is pretty clear. Short barrel rifles can have the concealability and maneuverability of a pistol, but with the firepower and accuracy of a rifle. And with shoulder stock devices out there that now fold all the way down or telescope out, you can easily fit one inside a backpack or a briefcase and no one would be the wiser. So, Director, the ATF issued a rule on so-called stabilizing braces recently because it was clear that many of the items being manufactured and sold as stabilizing braces were really just being used to try to get around the National Firearms Act. Isn't that correct? Whether a short-barreled rifle is sold in one piece or two pieces and you put them together, the rule was intended to cover what Congress defined as a short-barreled rifle. So people are taking legally purchased pistols, adding these devices marketed as stabilizing braces, but which are actually shoulder stocks, and changing the character of the gun, transforming it into an unregistered short-barreled rifle. Is that correct? Uh, if, the, if, it if it meets the definition under the rule, then that would be correct. 
So the ATF, in recognizing new technologies that are attempting and succeeding in working around the National Firearms Act, just like Glock switches, is appropriately regulating these things for what they are. My colleagues argued the other day that just a few ounces of plastic and metal can't transform a legal gun into an illegal one, but it sounds very much like you would disagree. Is that correct? They're not uh, illegal. Congress has determined that there are additional safeties and regulations that apply to certain Mad kinds of sleeping. particularly dangerous weapons. Thank and, you. And you can keep them. You just have to follow the rules that Congress has set up uh, to, to follow those controls. <laughs> Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I have a unanimous consent request. I ask unanimous consent that the drawing of the actual stabilizing braces, which was not what Mr. Massey held up, that was not, in fact, a regulated stabilizer. I'd ask uh, this document, which is the actual diagram of an actual stabilizing brace that was prohibited by ATF, so the record is not only complete, but accurate, be submitted into the record. So Celine's a so ordered. I'm just glad the guy's not holding up a picture of a bump stock. The uh, <laughs> uh, gentleman yields back. Uh, next, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy. Thank the chairman. Uh, thank you for appearing before the committee, uh, director. Uh, I served in the U.S. Attorney's Office, prosecuted 922 G1, 924 C, uh, felons in possession, and so forth. Um, uh, I would say that. Uh, well, let me ask you this question: There are different definitions of mass shootings. We've said that I think 160 or something mass shootings this year, or something in that zip code. However, you define that. I believe. In, in, no, no, so we get to the question. In, in your reporting of that, um, how many of those shooters? Uh, can you report we're on medication? I, I don't know the facts to be able to answer. I'm sorry. Okay, sir. Uh, I think that's an important thing, and I'd like ATF to get us an answer on the 165 uh, mass shootings, how many were on medication. Um, how many were from single uh, uh, parent homes without fathers? Again, those may not be all ATF investigations, and I don't know the answer to that. Well, but it's important you guys collect data on virtually everything. I think it's really important for us to know that. Can you tell us how many of the perpetrators were, for example, involved in social media and, and certain websites, or how many of them had dropped out of school? Uh, again, I don't have a number on that. I, okay. I would agree with you that those are all significant problems that we have to address as a society. Well, I think that's something that's really important, and I want ATF to get us that information, because uh, that has been missing from a lot of the conversation. As we, as we focus in on the weapons being, being used, I want us to make sure that we're very clear about the nature of the individuals that are carrying out these heinous acts, what is happening in our societies, what is happening to our young men, what is happening to young men in fatherless homes, what is happening to people on medication, what is happening with respect to mental health. Because if we look at the data and we see what has occurred, particularly under COVID, and we look at both suicide rates up like 10%, murder rates spiked like 40%, uh, and I think with the use of firearms, uh, we see that we had a serious mental health issue and the use of medication. I think that's something the ATF ought to focus on. But here's something that I want to, uh, to ask about. You all had an ATF agent named Brandon Garcia who submitted a resignation letter. I think you're probably familiar with in which uh, he wrote, ATF has been spending a significant amount of time talking about and changing the course of this agency to focus on, quote, the guns, end quote. Agent Garcia also noted the following. Last year, our headquarters spent pretty much the entire year talking about the vaccine and threatening termination for those who wouldn't get it. Uh, the deputy director threatened to prosecute agents for lying to a federal agent if we did not appropriately update our vaccination status in the system. He also noted uh, that they were um, saying nothing about holding people accountable for the crimes they commit unless it supports their agenda. I think that's a question that I think we all want to know the answer to, which is, are we focusing on going after criminals carrying out bad acts, harming the American people every day. for use of guns, every day. as opposed to targeting law-abiding citizens for the use of for having a, a, a weapon that they are entitled to be able to have under the Second Amendment? We, we are indeed focusing on taking violent criminals and trigger pullers out of our community. Of course, working with state and lo local law enforcement, right? Every day, and you know that from being a PSN prosecutor. I was a PSN prosecutor also. Those are very important. And with respect to the causes of, of, of these acts, I think it is correct there are numerous causes. ATF is not responsible for addressing them. Of course, Congress, you look at the whole field of play as to what uh, drives but, violent but, but crime. But does the director agree that it would be a very important thing for us as Congress and for ATF to focus on the mental state and the, and the medicines being used by the perpetrators of these crimes? I, I think certainly that public policymakers ought to focus on that. Well, well I, ATF, I appreciate that. I'm, an and I'm going to run out of time. One, one other, because I got limited sure. time. Sure. One other question with respect to the, the, the issue we're dealing here with the pistol braces. Uh, we know for sure that the um, 
United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit has overwhelmingly ruled that ATF uh, overstepped its authority when it published the final rule that classified bump stocks as machine guns. Now, to make sure that it's very clear that I'm an equal opportunity basher of tyranny, the Trump administration issued that bump stock rule, and they were wrong to do it. They shouldn't have done it. They did it. The Fifth Circuit struck it down. The fact is, what we know about this rule, the pistol brace rule, is that it is the exact same overstepping of power. And, that I, and, and I think the director ought to respond to, to that question in just one minute, but I want to ask one question uh, pretty quick uh, right here as I wrap up. Do you believe that Americans have an individual right to bear arms? Uh, the Supreme Court has said that. So yes, that there, the, the, the Supreme Court has said in the Heller decision and then in the Bruin decision uh, that the that Second it is an Amendment, individual right the to bear Second arms. Amendment gives the individual right to keep and bear arms. And so what I would just suggest to the director is that when we know the Fifth Circuit has slapped down a regulatory overreach with respect to bump stocks under a Republican president, and now we have a effort here under pistol braces, which is looking backwards to take a piece of plastic, as my friend from Kentucky said, to add to a weapon, and to say to someone who had a lawful product for the entire time they've had it, to now say that it is unlawful, would the director agree that that is something that the Fifth Circuit is very well going to look at and say that is an overstep of the executive branch over legislative authority? I yield back. You may answer the question. As with the, the bump stock case, um, it is in litigation. Um, different circuits have come out different ways on that, and is, I think there's a petition for certiorari before the Supreme Court. ATF's position on that, I mean the department's position, uh, is laid out in hundreds of pages of briefs. Uh, the first ruling, uh, which actually came out of uh, a district court in the Fifth Circuit on the, on the stabilizing base rule, found that it lived within the statute uh, and was lawful under the APA, at least as a preliminary injunction matter. But the Fifth Circuit has held that it, it, it has, has said that the, it the is courts, violent. Again, yeah. the gentleman yields. Uh, Ms. Scanlon, uh, you have five minutes for questioning. Thank you. And Here thank you, go. Director Delbach, for your testimony today. Uh, my constituents in our country are reeling from the daily toll of gun violence. A rational person should expect Congress to ask the head of ATF to come to Congress and uh, testify about what we can do to end this daily recurring national tragedy. But that's not why this hearing was called. Tom this Petty. hearing was called to attack ATF and its leadership, to undermine ATF's ability to do its job. It's been called to complain about technicalities and paperwork that actually save lives. Second Amendment extremists often claim we don't need new laws, we just need to enforce the laws that on the, are on the books. Extremists? But that's what a well-funded and fully staffed ATF does. It's critical to enforcing the laws that are already on the books and stemming the carnage caused by unlawful and irresponsible gun sales that are used to kill more than 130 Americans every day. I want to focus today on important ATF tools that can check rogue gun dealers uh, who profit from sales as they willfully enable violent crime with straw purchases and unlawful sales. And I know it's going to, we have to move quickly because of timing, so if you want to submit additional information, we'd love to see that. More than 20 years ago, an ATF study showed that just 1% of federal firearms licensees, or FFLs, were the source of more than 60% of all guns traced to crime nationwide. Since then, congressional gag laws have prevented ATF from publicly sharing data that can be used to examine patterns of gun trafficking or to identify gun dealers who profit from selling guns to criminals, whether directly or in indirectly. However, the Brady Center to Prevent Gr Gun Violence recently analyzed two decades of data about crime guns released by Pennsylvania, and that rep report confirmed the trend still holds, and in Pennsylvania, just 1% of gun dealers were the source of 50% of crime guns. Can you briefly tell us how ATF uses crime or trace data to prioritize dealers for compliance inspections and prevent firearms from being diverted into the illegal market? Um, ATF is committed to transparency to the extent allowed under the laws passed by Congress. And I would point out that recently, just several months ago, uh, under the direction of the Attorney General uh, and the President, ATF published uh, the single largest compendium of information on crime guns ever put in one place uh, in the United States in our, one of our firearms trafficking and commerce reports, volume two. It, it goes state by state. There are 40 cities. We will do 
uh, analyses for any cities that weren't included in the first 40. And it tells the, the story in a way that hasn't been told before with data as to how firearms get from lawful commerce to crime scenes. Um, we take that kind of data mm -hmm. and use it as part of our crime done intelligence program to try and target as best we can. And we can do better at this. Uh, we need to keep striving to push ourselves to be better as best we can our very limited resources to try and stop that flow of unlawful firearms so that we're, we're not focusing on the vast majority of firearms dealers, which are law abiding businesses. And we're focusing as much as possible either on those that willfully violate the law, but also it's important to understand to harden the targets uh, for because even if you're a, a law abiding firearms dealer, but you're being targeted by a, by a criminal drug, uh, firearms trafficking organization to help them to follow the rules which are designed to protect them from being victimized even unknowingly. Okay. So we work collaboratively with firearms dealers all over the country on this. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> one of the um, gun dealers that perhaps is not an unwilling victim is a Philadelphia gun shop called The Firing Line. And in this report published concerning Pennsylvania crime guns, um, it was determined that 1,800, 1,800 crime guns were traced to this one gun dealer between 1999 and 2020. A 2017 ATF inspection report of the dealer, which I have here, found multiple repeat violations, including willfully transferring firearms to prohibited purchasers, facilitate the straw purchase of firearms, missing firearms, and a failure to respond to ATF trace requests. Now, obviously, this is before your, uh, before your tenure. But do, despite that record, the Trump administration's ATF issued a warning to the dealer instead of revoking its license. They got a stern talking to, but they continue to profit from their sale of guns that are used in crimes in Pennsylvania and beyond. So Congress has given ATF authority to revoke licenses, can serious violations such as willful transfer um, trigger the zero tolerance policy that ATF is working on now? The, uh, the key word that you use is what Congress said, which is willful. Uh, when, when we find that firearms licensees are willfully violating uh, the, the laws that Congress has passed, and we have articulated several, I think five specific violations, although willful conduct is, is can be broader than that in certain circumstances. That's what we try to do with respect to targeting our resources with respect to filing a notice of revocation. After the notice is filed, the licensee has the right to a hearing and to go to federal district court as well. Thank you. And Chairman, I see my time has expired, but I have two unanimous consent requests. The first is I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a report from the Brady Center to prevent gun violence entitled Uncovering the Truth About Pennsylvania Crime Guns. So ordered. Okay. I also seek unanimous consent to enter into the record the video played by Mr. Cicilline at last week's Judiciary Committee markup that demonstrates how the gun industry markets and many gun buyers actually use the stabilizing braces, not as assistive technology for disabled veterans, but as a way to convert large format pistols into short barreled rifles and evade the National Firearms Act. So ordered. Thank you. Generally, the yields. Uh, next, I'd like to take five minutes to ask a few questions, uh, Director Dettelbach. Um, are you familiar with Operation Fearless from a decade ago? I'm sorry. I'm so Operation Fearless from a decade ago, are you familiar with that? I, I don't know that I'm familiar with the details of that particular operation. If you start talking about it, maybe I'll be reminded of the, the name, but not as I sit here. So the largest uh, state newspaper in Wisconsin wrote about it, suggested a lack of planning and oversight in regards to uh, trying to get people um, who were running drugs, running guns, stuff like that. I take it you're not familiar with that. Uh, again, by name, I'm, uh, if you could, it, was, it a, uh, was this uh, related to uh, a certain type of investigative technique? It might, it, I might know it not by the name, but by the, but by the facts, as you say. Them. Yeah, so it happened in Milwaukee, and they found out later after the investigative story was put out by the journal Sentinel in Milwaukee that this was actually being done in five other cities also and um, are these type of operations still going on Again, around the country? No, I, not knowing the type, uh, what type of operation, if you tell me the, just in general, I can. Um, so failed operation, Operation Fearless, um, is an ATF violent crime impact team opened a storefront in Milwaukee neighborhood. A storefront. Yep. 
Um, so with respect to, and I, I do remember some of the public reporting on, on the storefront issue. So, so I'm, I'm not going to comment on any ongoing under operation that ATF may be or may not be undertaking, but I can, I'm glad to talk about that, which is, look, when we do at, in law enforcement, are there, we do, let, let me, are there operations like that? I, I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to reveal whether any law enforcement ongoing pending operation is occurring now or not. Okay. Thank you. That would endanger people uh, in the field, and we can't do that. Um, because it was a failed operation, and it was shown that it was being done around the country by the ATF, ATF and, um, which was really a serious problem. And we would like to know if things like that are going on. Well, so, no, but I understand. With respect to storefronts generally, I think there, there, there was public reporting, and there were some issues with the way that storefront operation was conducted. ATF did, I believe, I wasn't there, but my understanding is from the U.S. Attorney's community, my knowledge there was that ATF did impose additional restrictions and change the way those operations were, were going to, to try and better run them. If you'd provide that data, that'd be terrific. I think um, in that, if I remember correctly. If you would. So the, pro I'm sorry. Um, is it a, pro I take it it's a priority um, at ATF to review FFL violations. Is that correct? Um, it, it's a priority at ATF to focus on violent crime and to try to get shooters and to stop the supply of unlawful firearms to those most violent people. That is a priority at ATF. Do you agree with um, the Biden administration's zero tolerance policy that they've enacted in regards to um, FFLs? Uh, we implement the Enforced and in Regulatory Enhancement Initiative, uh, which people call different things, and I think we're referring to the same thing, which focuses on a, a, a limited number of willful violations um, and so uh, Congress has said that that's what we should is, be focusing on. Is, well, that's what the Biden administration said. It was an executive Co Congress order. said that willful violations are the only kind that can result in revocation. So um, the number of revoked FFLs are up significantly, correct, in 2022? Uh, I believe that there were 90-some that were uh, reduced, as a result of this particular enforcement. Has it reduced crime? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> The, co the congressman was talking about this before. There are lots of causes of gun crime, and it's impossible to say that any one of them is going to be the silver bullet. But that, to me, doesn't mean you don't work on all of them if, to try and address the issue. Sure. Um, so as we talk about these um, FFLs, um, do you have regular training for your employees in regards to how to review these um, FFL? Regular training. I'm sorry, I just had, yes, we have regular training for our employees at ATF. Yes, we do, Congressman. And are there violations for violating these firearms transaction records? Are there, are there, are, are there penalties for violations? Uh, there, if an oh, FFL, out. if an FFL is in violation, there's a series of different actions at different levels that the statute allows ATF to take. And also firearm uh, transaction records, right? Like if, like a 4473? Yeah, or? if they inaccurately fill that out or if they lie on it, there's penalties. Well, the, right? the person who's, who's buying the weapon fills out many parts of the 4473, and if that person who's buying the weapon uh, doesn't tell the truth on those forms, there are, there are serious penalties for lying on that form. If they violate, should they be prosecuted? Um, yes, that's no? up to U.S. attorneys' offices to determine. We investigate cases, refer to them to U.S. refer them to U.S. attorneys' offices, and they make those determinations. So, if someone violates, regardless of who they are in society, they're turned over to um, uh, to a district attorney and to be charged. If 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 ATF investigates a matter and believes that there's been a violation, it would be referred to the appropriate prosecutor. Should the president's son be turned over since he violated Form Four Four Seven Three? I think that's been publicly reported that that is an ongoing investigation. Again, I am not going to comment on any ongoing investigation. So you don't take a position on we should have equal justice, we should not have a two-tier system of justice? Uh, I'm, I'm not able to comment on any ongoing investigation, whether it's the, the, the undercover operations that you referred to or any particular case. I just can't comment under longstanding Department of Justice policy, under both parties' administrations on pending investigative matters. I've exceeded my time um, and yield that time and would recognize the gentlewoman from Georgia, Ms. McBath. Ugh, thank you go. so much, Chairman, and thank you, um, Director Dettelbeck. Uh, it's good to see you, and thank you for coming before the Judiciary Committee today. Um, I thank you so very much for the important work that you're doing in your role as Director of the ATF 
uh, the first permanent one that we've actually had in this country in over eight years. Uh, can you imagine that? And so eight years, um, the ATF conducts, you conduct some of the most critical work of preventing crime from happening, uh, such as by ensuring background checks are completed uh, so that those who are not legal, legally able to possess a firearm cannot actually purchase them. Uh, ATF, we know, also works with local and state law enforcement, as he has expressed over and over again this morning, to trace firearms that have been used in violent crimes, to uh, assist in making convictions in prior crimes and stopping future crimes from happening. They also work to prevent illegal firearms trafficking, reducing the risk of public safety in our towns and our cities. If this Congress is committed to keeping our community safe, keeping Americans whole, we must do everything in our power to support the ATF and its initiatives. Director Dettelbach, one of the great achievements of the 117th Congress was the pass passage of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Law. That was my law. The most significant gun safety package in almost 30 years. The initiatives set forth in that law include things such as funding for the implementation of extreme risk protection order programs and laws that ensure that firearms are not in the hands of those a court has found through due process as a danger to themselves or to their community. Funding for community violence intervention and working to close the gun show loophole. Please share with us, because I do believe that you have been just unjustifiably kind of attacked today. So please share with us how the ATF is implementing all of the provisions of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, that law. Thank you. Uh, Congress passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act shortly before I came on as director of ATF. And since that time, the parts that actually fall within ATF's jurisdiction, we've been working very hard to implement. There are other parts because this is an all of the above approach uh, that has to be taken to, to violent crime. Others are working on more. But two of the things that, that Congress did was gave us our first standalone straw purchase felony and our first standalone firearms trafficking felony under federal law. Um, and we have been investigating with our state and local partners uh, those kinds of cases. Um, and we brought over 30 different defendants, more than that, have been prosecuted. The other thing I wanna say is, you know, we also work with industry. So a couple of weeks ago, I was in St. Louis uh, with the National Shooting Sports Foundation, uh, rolling out the, the Don't Lie for the Other Guy campaign there. That's a campaign where we work together to try and educate firearms dealers, licensees, I was in a gun store, uh, to, to catch straw purchasers, how to recognize it, what to do, because they are often our first line of defense. Um, and so we are doing enforcement, we're doing education, we're doing training, we've trained uh, everybody at ATF, so thousands and then thousands of prosecutors across the country. I have personally gone to speak to large groups of law enforcement agencies uh, about this. So it's, an, uh, again, an all of the above approach to do what we can. Congress didn't give us any money for that, but we are not stopping. We're gonna do everything we can to implement that important law. Well, thank you, so in what ways does ATF, um, well, you really kind of already asked, um, answered the question. I wanted to know how did you work with state uh, uh, and local law enforcement agencies, but you you really kind of stated that in that last answer. But why are these partnerships so important to ATF? Yeah. We are a very small agency compared to all the other federal law enforcement agencies. We're a small law enforcement agency, 5,000 plus people with a huge mission. Um, it's all gallows humor, right? Well, we have five, but at least we don't have a big mission, violent crime, right? It's, 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 hard, it's, hard, it's, it's a very difficult, large mission. Um, so how do you do it? You do it by force multiplication and partnership. Uh, you do it by sitting on task forces. You do it by sending an agent to work in the homicide unit of a major city police department. You do it by working on the carjacking initiatives that we're working on in Philadelphia. You do it by going after the gangs along with state and local law enforcement that we do in California, in New York, in the middle of the country, all over the country. Every single day, ATF, and I, I 
work with the other law enforcement agencies, and I have for years, but ATF, we do that partnership with state and local law enforcement better than anybody. And when I go and talk to chiefs, the number one thing that chiefs and sheriffs say over and over again is please send more ATF resources. And I tell them that everybody is asking for it and you're all correct. Thank you, and I'm out of time. The gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Sparks, is recognized for five minutes. This Thank you, Mr. Good. Chairman. Uh, Director Dettelbach, what is the core mission of your agency? The core mission is to prevent and protect the American people from violent crime. So do you believe that you know, trying to, you know, pretty much turn millions of Americans, law-abiding citizens, into criminals just for owning a piece of plastic is really where you should put so much emphasis? Is it something you have nothing else to do? Uh, uh, I, I, in, I don't want to repeat the answers I've given because I know you have limited time, but so no, I don't believe big that. Priority and, for your agents? and I don't believe that's what we are doing. We are effectuating, Congress passes a law. Well, that's Congress, what you're doing in the fact, you know, that's what you're trying to do. But I yield my time to Mr. Messi of Kentucky. Smart. Thank the gentlelady from Indiana. Uh, Mr. Dettelbach, you were asked a question by a Democrat earlier about the statistics on the defensive use of firearms. Uh, are you aware that CDC used to track that and that they've removed it from their website? Uh, I, I'm not aware of all the CDC things that they tracked. I know at one point there were prohibitions on them uh, publishing data. I do not know what, uh, what that situation at is. One, at one time, the CDC tracked the defensive use of firearms, and after officials were lobbied by activist gun control organizations, they removed that data. I think it'd be helpful to have that data. Let me ask another question very quickly. Um, the, the regulatory impact assessment on page 18, you, you, your agency says you considered the numbers, uh, the impact, and to look at the number of people impacted, their amount of dollars, you considered from 2013 to 2020. Why did you not consider 2020, 2021, and 2022 in the regulatory impact assessment? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, uh, of what? You're, are you talking uh, of the, about? I'm sorry, on the uh, pistol braces, the number oh. of pistol braces. So, so I don't have it in front of me. I know that the notice of proposed rulemaking came out before I came on, and I think it was sometime in 2021. I don't know when data was referred, but I do know that there is significant information in that uh, APA record uh, and in the public document that is not consistent with some of the numbers that people have, have said here today about how many individuals are impacted. It's it's because yes, the, the RA uh, understates greatly the, no, the impact of this because you didn't consider the most recent numbers of production in the millions, you left off millions of them. A uh, quick question about a couple other topics here. Um, do you, you know, the bump stock regulation was in response to a shooting in Las Vegas. Do you have any information at all that might lead you to believe there were actually NFA weapons uh, in Las Vegas, in other words, guns that have been converted to machine gun fire or unregistered machine guns in addition or instead of the bump stocks? Uh, I, I, was, I am not privy to the details of the investigation, so I do not have any information about the details of Who, that. Who's in possession of those firearms? Uh, I don't know who's in possession of those firearms. Um, we'd like to know that. Also, I see that you're cooperating with the FBI, the ATF is on the January 6th pipe bomb investigation. What can you tell us about how that's going um, uh, obviously, that's a significant matter. It is an ongoing criminal investigation, and so I'm not going to comment on an ongoing criminal investigation. Were, were those pipe bombs operable? Again, I mean, again. The ATF is the expert. Again, it's an ongoing and criminal investigation, and under longstanding policy, I cannot comment. And we've just had a whole committee for two years that investigated ongoing investigations, so I'm not accepting that answer from you. Uh, we need to know these things. Do you know how the pipe bomb was discovered at the DNC? We've been told how it was discovered at the RNC. And, it, and according to a press release from the FBI, you're working with them on this investigation. Respectfully, um, I understand your disagreement, but I cannot comment because it is an ongoing criminal investigation. Well, I, I think you can comment. Can you tell me uh, in the time that we have remaining why a national firearms registry is not only against the law, but also extremely problematic for law abiding Americans? Uh, the reason that a national firearms registry is against law is because Congress has passed a provision prohibiting ATF from having a national firearms registry. 
Um, it's against the law in short because Congress has determined it's against the law and we will do and need to continue to follow that law because Congress makes those decisions. Is it if you require millions of gun owners to, to register firearms simply because they have a piece of plastic, are you circumventing this congressional law against the registry of firearms? Um, the National Firearms Act provides for a different registry, has since 1934. Something like 50 Congresses have sat between now and then and, and have not changed well, that. Well, let me just clarify, you swept millions of firearms into that registry without an act of Congress, and uh, my time has expired. I recognize Ms. Dean from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I too want to acknowledge uh, all of the advocates who are here today. I know I see mom's demand in great numbers. Thank you for your extraordinary patience uh, and tenacity and work. We will get this done. Uh, it's just a question I of will. when and how many lives will it take in the meantime. Uh, I think we also have uh, students' demand. I think we even have a survivor of gun violence. We have Brady. We have Everytown. We might have 97 percent. To all of the advocates, even if you're not a part uh, of one of these groups, I thank you. I think every American citizen is a mom's demand, is a dad's demand, is a student's demand. That's who we are. My constituents are talking to me and demanding that we do better, that we do more, that the price of the Second Amendment is not lives. We have to prize life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness uh, as much as some prize guns. So to the survivor today, thank you for being with us. Thank you for your strength. I met with students this week. I have an uh, advisory committee of high school students. I meet with them quarterly. and. Uh, I have been thinking about them as I've sat through this absurd hearing, a hearing where the director of ATF and the incredible men and women who are involved in the work of ATF, law enforcement work to keep us safer, are being attacked. When I met with the students this week, it was one of my worst meetings with them. They were notably down. They were worried for their future. Their number one worry, gun violence. Number one worry. They said they didn't have real hope. They're tired of training for active shooter drills. And I'm a grandmother of four. I'm very upset to think any day of the week my granddaughter, 11 years old, is doing active shooter drills. So I sit here thinking this is a nightmarish hearing. It is Orwellian. Do the folks on the other side of the aisle see the, the worries of our students, the nightmarish upside down version of a hearing that we are having today, attacking the very people who are trying to keep us safe? The folks on the other side who spent the last election cycle saying Democrats want to defund the police, while they actively say they would like to eliminate ATF, actively said, would like to defund ATF. Abolish. What my students talked to me about was their worry over their own safety, their own lives, their own mental health. Um, what they talked to me about was attacks on rights, whether it's trans rights or women's rights. You know what they didn't mention to me? Regulation of stabil stabilizer braces. That was not on their agenda. It wouldn't have made their top 100. Speech. In fact, it would not have made their list at all. We could learn a lot from those kids, and I will continue to listen to them and promise them, promise them that along with your help and your extraordinary leadership, we will get this done. So let's go to the actual work that you do. Could we talk about, could you tell me about the work that ATF does? Uh, I know you spoke a little bit about the tracing of guns, which is crime guns, which is so critically important. Um, what does ATF uh, crime gun tracing work look like? Could you describe it to us uh, sure. in a little way? So uh, when a crime happens and a local police department, usually it's local because they have most of the cases, opens a case and they associate a particular firearm with a crime. It's found at the scene uh, or what have you. They then submit a request to ATF to trace that firearm. Now, ATF... Um, 
can't, can't, we don't have a national gun registry by law. So what we can do is what we can trace do? the firearm to its first retail sale uh, that we know of. That's usually what happens. And we don't have that record, so we get the request in, and if it's a firearms dealer that is still in business, we reach out to them and we say, we don't have the record. We say, can you tell us who purchased this firearm? Pull the 4473 and tell us. Then we can relay that information back to the local police departments. They're often conducting very time-sensitive investigations, and they can follow that lead. If it's a firearms dealer that's out of business, they send their out-of-business records to ATF. They're, they have to be stored in a certain format under the law that Congress has passed. We are, I think, the only customer of Adobe Acrobat. We pay extra money to remove search function from that uh, so that we can uh, then uh, uh, try our best to trace it as quickly as we can and get that same information back to that homicide detective, that gang detective, that narcotics detective who's working the case. The gentleman's time is inspired, Mr. I, I, I just want to ask one question. For five if, minutes. if you would uh, send to us information the gentleman's on time is expired. The, impl the implications of the Safer Communities Act. Anything you're learning, please send it along to us. Thank you. I yield. Mr. Fitzgerald is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, uh, Director, for being here today. I, oftentimes at these hearings, I just want to bring some balance, I think, because uh, a lot of figures are, are tossed around. But I just want to remind people, uh, in the state of Wisconsin, my home state, 422,000 permits were sold for deer hunting over a nine-day season. For the most part, very safe nine days. It's a huge part of our history in Wisconsin. Doesn't sound safe for the deer. And I'm very, and I'm very proud uh, to, to say that those people also have to be represented today in this room. Um, I, I wanna just change the topic very quickly. In February, 2023, I sent you a letter alongside of some of my other colleagues requesting that you and the Attorney General, Attorney General Garland, uh, just give us some input on proposed legislation that would remove certain less than lethal weapons from the Gun Control Act. Um, and what I'm talking about are stun guns. Um, as you may be aware, uh, any less than lethal weapon, such as a taser that uses any type of explosive charge uh, to obviously shoot the projectile, which has wires attached to it, um, it, it although it's not lethal, it's, it's categorized uh, under the GCA. Uh, it, there's very low probability, and I have an actual manufacturer that's, that's in my district who has contacted me about this. So I, what I'm asking is, what is uh, your position on uh, not only non-lethal devices, but just how did they end up in that category of the Gun Control Act of 1968? Um, so um, uh, thank you for the question. And, and obviously it uh, goes without saying, but I, I, it needs to, it's important to say that uh, law-abiding citizens who are hunting we're doing things that, that are protected by the Constitution. ATF respects uh, and, and that activity, and we need to continue to do that. That's good to hear. But with respect to the, the Gun Control Act, so the, the definition that Congress wrote talks about, I think the words are by means of explosive, by explosion, right? So I, and I, I, I don't want to get out ahead of myself, but I can check and get back to you on the letter. But I think that language that Congress wrote is covering some things and then not others. Like for instance, if there's a different way of expelling the item, it wouldn't be covered under, the, under what Congress wrote. So I think the reason why some things are covered and some things are not goes back to the statutory definition. And again, as I pointed out, the marketplace right can, can, can change and products are developed. So sometimes the law, uh, uh, you know, um, is applied in ways that people may or may not anticipate. So let me just ask you, so as uh, your experience as a civil rights division attorney, do, do you think that the non-lethal devices have an effect on reducing the use of force uh, on the street when a, when, a, when a law enforcement officer would obviously garner a taser versus their firearm? So I wanna be careful, I don't over, overstep my expertise. Uh, but I have had some experience. Uh, and so uh, the more, the, the, uh, when police officers have options as to what to, to do and what to use, right? They, are, they have more different ways they can respond to a situation. Now there are different rules 
or uh, devices uh, that are possessed by law enforcement as well uh, under the statute that Congress wrote. So would you agree the incorporating, that incorporating non-lethal weapons in the GCA definition of a firearm, it, you know, that might actually hamper our ability to develop so, new types of, um, new, new, new avenues for law enforcement? I, I don't know the full answer to that question. I understand that you have a letter pending. I will check into it and uh, we'll try to respond. I mean, wouldn't it make sense to, to put an exception in there for tasers? Uh, I mean, I, it, it, to me, I mean, and like I said, there's a private corporation that's very frustrated by the characterization under the GCA. So I, I'm just wondering, it, it makes common sense, doesn't it? I, I, I just, I. I know it's frustrating, but there's a very significant process for uh, people in the executive branch weighing in on legislation. And uh, I, I can tell you, I will, I will check on this in response to your letter. Well, thank you very much. And I expect uh, some type of response. Thank you. I yield back. That was worthless. Ms. Escobar is recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Dittelbach and to members of your team. Thank you so much for your public service. Thank you for your work. Um, thank you for doing everything you can to increase safety in our country and communities across America. I want to thank the volunteers who are here today, mm -hmm. and I know that there are many, many more who are watching throughout the country. All these incredible advocates and activists who come if together watching, time and up. again to demand <laughs> fundamental safety for yourselves, for your families, for our smallest tiniest Americans, thank you for everything that you do. I represent El Paso, Texas, a community that has had two mass shootings since 2019. I have also had someone very close to me murdered uh, uh, through gun violence. It is absolutely everywhere. We are a nation awash in guns. And it's not that we are becoming a more violent country per se, or a, a country that, that is actually seeing massive increases in crime, it's that the crimes are getting deadlier because of the weapons that have flooded our communities. In fact, one of my local newspapers, the, uh, the El Paso Times, recently had an article about how juvenile crime is not up. In fact, in many ways, Juvenile crime in my community is stable, but what has changed is that that crime is now more frequently uh, used uh, by juveniles with access to guns because it is so easy to get guns in our country. So we're seeing more bloodshed, more death, more fear. And we heard from my colleague in Pennsylvania who talked about uh, her visit with young people in her district it was eerily similar to what I was gonna share with you. Just this weekend, I met with my Youth Advisory Council, incredibly talented, optimistic, hopeful, ambitious young people. And one of their top topics, in fact, the biggest issue for them right now is gun violence and the fear that they live in. I cannot believe the trauma that we are instilling in our children because we cannot come to an agreement that their lives have value. And it is stunning to me that we're not moving closer and closer to common sense solutions. What is happening is we've been, House Democrats, Senate Democrats, we've been consistent in wanting common sense solutions. But it's been my Republican colleagues that have been moving the needle in the other direction. In fact, looser gun laws making sure more people have more guns, making sure those guns are even deadlier. Oh, and let's fight about what they call a piece of plastic that makes shootings deadlier, more targeted. It is really un unbelievable to me. And now they have really ramped up the extremism to the point where not only are we further and further away from common sense solutions, but they now want to abolish the ATF. This should not be a surprise. This is the same party that wants to abolish the FBI. Mr. Dettelbach, I'd like to ask you a question. A 2021 investigation found many instances 
in which federally licensed gun dealers were violating the law but were allowed to stay open. According to that investigation, ATF officials had been routinely downgrading the recommendations for disciplining these gun dealers so they could continue selling guns. According to the article, more than 200 dealers were cited for selling guns to people who indicated on background check paperwork that they were prohibited from owning them. Dozens made false statements in official records. A Florida gun dealer sold a handgun to a convicted felon in a parking lot, and the examples go on and on. Overall, the investigation found that approximately 99% of the businesses found to have violated the law were allowed to stay open. By revoking the licenses of corrupt or irresponsible gun dealers, is the ATF acting on new regulations or enforcing longstanding law? Uh, at ATF, we do not uh, write the law. Congress writes the law, and we enforce that long-standing law. I, I, I believe that you're referring to a recent Inspector General uh, report, um, and that was a report that, uh, that I think had a lot of different recommendations. We welcome them. We will seek to implement recommendations from that report to do our job more effectively and efficiently to use crime gun intelligence. We've already started doing that. Uh, changing because the period was already 16 months old, so we've already started doing that. Uh, and that was a report um, that I, I think one of the, sum, the bottom lines of that report sort of criticized that what, ATF wasn't being strict enough, right? And so uh, what we do at ATF is we try to do the best we can with the resources that we have. Uh, these, the men and women who are out there inspecting, there are 800 of them total for uh, nearing 100,000 federal licensed firearms dealers and more inspections because we also have to inspect all the explosive dealers every three years. Um, we will continue to work hard to apply the laws Congress has written it and to hold those accountable uh, who are committing willful violation and to work with the, the law abiding uh, firearms dealers to try and protect the American people together in partnership. Thank you so much. Yield back. I'd like to take a, a moment to ask a few questions of the witness. Uh, Director uh, Tettelbach, thank you for your testimony uh, today. Do you believe that the Second Amendment uh, is an important right? I believe all the uh, constitutional rights that we have are important. So you're not one of those people who says we'd be better off without it? Uh, I'm one of those people who says what the law says, what the Constitution says, is what we should do and, and what we have to honor. I understand that, and I'm glad to hear you say that. But uh, as sort of a matter of what's best for society, do you think it's important that our Constitution does have a Second Amendment? I think that all the amendments are important. It's very hard to start comparing the right to freedom of religion versus the right. To, they're all important. They're okay, all so important why do you rights. think the Second Amendment is important? Why, why do why, I? Why is it important that we have a Second Amendment? Well, at the, most, at the most basic notion, because I'm an American, because I follow the Constitution and the, the, the founders, uh, or sure, or sure when they I'm enacted the Bill of Rights, I mean, right. I, it, I, uh, it why say? is it important, the Second Amendment, that particular right, why is it important? I mean, I mean it's, it's part of our founding document. It's in the Constitution of the United States, along with all these other uh, rights that are so, very so you're important. you're glad it's there, the Second Amendment? Sorry? You're glad it's there. You're glad it's part of our Constitution. Uh, it's part of being an American is that that Constitution, when we take an oath in public service, unlike any other country, right, we take an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States. That's what we swear to do. It, sure. so, so that's an important oath, and it, that's a very important document. And I'm glad to hear you say that. We have had amendments that have been repealed. You're not someone who says it'd be better if we just repealed the Second Amendment, right? Uh, I, I have never participated in anything like that. And again, but your it opinion, is my job. Your opinion, it is you, my job. Be a good or bad thing. It is, it is my job as ATF director uh, to honor the, 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 the constitutional rights and legal statutes passed by Congress, and I do. And I'm very glad to hear you say that. But as an American, uh, do you think that'd be a good or bad thing if the amendment was repealed? Again, I, I don't think as director of ATF, me, me giving my personal opinions on which laws are more or less important is, is, is the right thing to do. But something in the Constitution is, of course, very important. Okay, so you don't want to say right now, affirm that you believe it's good that we have a Second Amendment? I, I, I don't want to... I don't think it's appropriate to give my personal opinion on any of the particular amendments. They're in the Constitution. All right. They Thank are the much. highest law of the land. So you also uh, testified in your written testimony uh, that we have more than 100 people who die from firearms violence across the country every day, and you say that most of these tragedies uh, never make the news. 
Are you aware of a, uh, and I think we can all agree that this is uh, you know, an unspeakable tragedy for every family. Are you aware of a study from 2017 by the University of Chicago sh that showed that the average murder or shooting suspect had approximately 12 prior arrests in their criminal record? I'm not aware of that particular study, but I, I'm not aware of that particular study, no, sir. Does it sound wrong to you or does it sound plausible? Uh, I think, as I said before, it, there's this many people who do crimes and then trigger pullers are a much smaller percentage and they tend to repeat sure. uh, crimes. And identifying those for state and local law enforcement is very important Absolutely. so we can focus our resources on the shooters, right? Sure, exactly. And the DC uh, police chief has said that it's on average 11 uh, prior arrests for uh, homicide suspects. In this jurisdiction, this is Robert Conti, chief of police in DC. Uh, he said that what we've got to do if we really want to see homicides go down is keep bad guys with guns in jail. When they're in jail, they can't be in communities shooting people. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, we work very closely with DC police when their lab was decertified. Okay, I'm not we asking who over you work the with gun lab. You I'm asking, do you agree with that statement from the chief of police when they're in jail, they can't be in communities shooting people? Uh, uh, dangerous people who commit violent crimes should be incarcerated. All right, thank you. We've heard a lot of statements from the other side of the dais today, uh, sort of in very high tones, uh, speaking about the lack of uh, efforts to, uh, to deal with gun violence and a lot of very partisan attacks. But as you might be aware, uh, Congress recently actually acted uh, for, uh, to prevent uh, violent crime in Washington, D.C. by repealing a measure that would have lowered penalties for crime across the board that the District of Columbia uh, had enacted. Now, that measure uh, was signed into law by President Biden, uh, as you may know. Uh, 81 members of the U.S. Senate voted for it, 81 to 14. And yet every single person on the other side today who has spoken up saying uh, that we need to do more about gun violence voted against that measure. Does that strike you as a hypocritical, Director? Um. <laughs> Sitting here today, there are obviously very passionate views on all sides, as I said, in the middle here. Sure. Um, and it's, it's not my role to engage in, in that kind of role. I run a law enforcement agency, and the decisions that Congress makes on policy are things that we then take and try to implement in the but, but your testimony talked at great length about gun violence, and you've just recognized that much of it stems from repeat offenders. So isn't it a good thing that we managed to at least make it so we don't have as many repeat offenders in this district? Uh, again, I, I don't run law enforcement in the district. They're partners of ours. We work closely with them. Um, and, and I'm not a policymaker. I'm not a member of this body. I leave it to members of these bodies to make those policy decisions. Then we take the results and try to protect people with them. Uh, thank you. Ms. Bish is recognized for five minutes. Oh. Ms. Bush is recognized for five minutes. Yeah, Bush. Um, thank you. Uh, first, let me just say to the advocates um, that are in the room, to Moms Demand Action, Students Demand, to every town, to every single advocate, survivor that is here, I'm sorry that you have to continue to keep coming back and, you know, and, uh, and, and advocating in this way and putting yourself in the middle of this trauma and pulling that forward to be able to males. save more lives. But as an activist myself, let me just tell you, on those days when it feels like it's, I'm tired, I can't do anymore, just know that you continue, your presence continuing to show up, continuing to speak, continuing letting us see you, letting people see you, just know even if it means you save one life. That's a life that you save. You're saving lives. So I just want to remind you all that um, that your work is not in vain. Uh, uh, St. Louis and I are here today to talk about accountability for gun violence, um, for this epidemic that continues to ravage our communities and our country. As my colleagues have pointed out, we lose a, approximately 120 people in this country every single day to gun violence. And firearm-related incidents are the leading cause of death for children and for teenagers in the United States. And that has been okayed. Actually, we've given it like a red carpet. This is no coincidence. It is the obvious consequence of dangerous policies in Republican-controlled states that flood, our gun, that flood our streets with guns and enable mass shootings that shatter families and destroy lives. I know this personally as someone who has survived and been traumatized myself by gun violence. But the Republicans are desperate to make ATF a distraction from their pathetic and shameful obedience to the NRA that's getting people <laughs> killed. That obedience is having a devastating impact on communities around our country. Director Dettelback, thank you for being here, and I'd like to ask you, Acts. yes or no, would you agree that the states with the weakest laws restricting gun ownership have Republican legislatures? I'm talking about Missouri, Alaska, Wyoming, Montana, uh, Mississippi. 
Respectfully, it is not my role to, to talk about the, these kinds of questions in my law enforcement role. Well, I will say, I can tell you that a recent study by Every Town comprehensively documents the states with the weakest gun laws. The weakest gun laws, the states with the weakest gun laws are overwhelmingly Republican states. It's the Democrat cities, though. Yes or no, it. Director. Would you agree that these states have some of the highest rates of gun violence? Uh, and again, uh, I'm not there to take issue with any of the data that you said, but in my role as running a law enforcement agency, we take the laws that are passed by legislatures like Congress, and we implement them as best we can to protect people. Others have that debate and will continue to, of course. It's an important discussion. I'm not minimizing it. In my current role, it's just not part of what I'm focused on doing. Well, thank you for that. Um, and they do. For example, in my home state of Missouri, which is a Republican state, it is among the 10 states with the highest rates of gun deaths in the country, the highest rates of gun deaths and the weakest gun laws in the Louis. country. This is a state that Donald Trump won. And yes or no, um, Director, would you agree that lax gun policies in certain states have resulted in firearms flooding municipalities that are unable to override those state level policies? And, uh, again, respectfully, I don't know the details of all that, but it wouldn't be in my role as ATF director, as a law enforcement officer, to, to become involved in debates in state, state policy matters. Communities like St. Louis experienced the brunt of gun violence, this epidemic, because of state-level policies in Missouri and elsewhere that failed to enact common sense gun laws to keep our communities safe. Republicans' failure to act is deadly. We've seen it over and over again, it's deadly. Less than six months ago, we had a mass shooting at the Central Visual and Performing Arts High School in St. Louis that may have been prevented if Missouri Republicans had agreed to enact a red flag law. <laughs> so when we talk about accountability, we need to talk about who's really at fault here, and we need to make sure that our communities aren't being fairly, unfairly targeted by the failures of others. So, um, Director, let me ask, let me switch gears. Thanks. The ATF has had issues in the past with racist and bigoted behavior by agents. Um, yes or no, are you aware of the good old boys roundup that the ATF agents participated in in the 1980s and 90s? I, I am not. I would say I have been to St. Louis recently, and the, the shooting that you referenced, I just want to say, of course, the survivors of gun violence. I meet with victims and survivors wherever I go. Mm -hmm. ATF was among the first people uh, participating in that investigation on that scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to say uh, there's a lot of uh, really good collaborative work going on in St. Louis that I know you know about mm -hmm. to try and help protect people uh, both, both sides of the river. Uh, on this issue. Right, and your work is being inhibited by those Republican policies, but thank you. You're right, we are collaborating. No, they're not. Um, and uh, can you, Which would you the answer the up? good old boys roundup question? I, I don't, ladies, I, time I, is I can up. follow okay. up on that. I don't know about that city. Okay, we will send you the information. Thank you, and I yield back. Chair recognizes Mr. Klein for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director, for being here. You know, from day one, uh, President Biden has made it clear that he intends to target the Second Amendment rights of millions of law-abiding Americans, from the ATF pistol brace rule to the recent zero tolerance executive order targeting federal firearm licenses and background checks, it's more apparent than ever that the rights of law-abiding Americans are under attack. I want to go to the out-of-business records issue, again, it was discussed earlier. As you know, uh, FFLs must give their server of firearm transaction records to the ATF once they go out of business. And these files are converted into screenshots, which you testified that ATF cannot be searched elect electronically. And that by, Adobe, by name. By name, right. Um, so let's talk about that, because the data is searchable by other computer functions, correct? Uh, I don't, I don't want to get, I, I want to get, I don't want to misstate on a technical yes, question, because do. I'm not, certainly not a computer expert. My understanding is we take out functionality to flatten that data right. that limits its search function consistent with the restrictions set by Congress. Um, and that most of that was already happening before that report, but then there was some, uh, an individual server uh, that had not been accessed but was not compliant that had to be, we had to, to do that with that particular data to make okay. sure that we were fully compliant. So you're aware that uh, a FOIA request by 
uh, the Gun Owners of America revealed that a user can filter results using serial number, document type, FFL number, role, frame, manufacturer, weapon type, caliber, model, batch description, batch name, and comments. Uh, so, so we are compliant with the restrictions that Congress has set forth, but uh, uh, Congressman, this is, these, these, sir, these, these background checks that we conduct are done in homicide investigations where time matters and lives matter. And we uh, are going to use the allowable things that we can do to try and help local law enforcement to catch killers. Uh, right, you've said that ATF processes tens of millions of records per year. And in 2021, ATF told Congress they had over 920 million out of business records, including both digital and paper records. So has ATF's out of business record gun registry surpassed 1 billion records total? Um, I don't know. I know that last year, the paper records we received were something like 70 million. And uh, I'm not quite sure of the exact number. Uh, there are a tremendous amount of records that we receive and we are doing our best. Some of them are stored in boxes that sit on the side and we run into those boxes where there's an investigation and try to try to help our local law enforcement partners. We're but, doing our best. But with all of these, this information that you're gathering that is searchable, uh, that is enough for you to create a list of, of every, for example. Uh, it's not. Well, it is. Every single firearms dealer that's currently in business, every single one, we don't have type. any records. You have the ability to create a registry, for example, of AR-15s and create an enforcement list of his new ban on pistol brace weapons, correct? Uh, I disagree. Well, I think the uh, evidence is clear that you have that ability, even if you say you don't. Uh, the just freezing uh, the name, the searchable uh, database by name is not enough. Uh, so what we have here is uh, valid concerns that ATF is taking a backdoor approach to creating a federal firearms registry despite congressional intent and the law that says no such registry should be created. So last year, we received a response to a letter sent to ATF regarding our concerns surrounding the out-of-business records and a potential gun registry. And in response, you said, or the ATF said, the vast majority of the criminal firearms traces completed by ATF NTC are done for state and local law enforcement agencies, as you just said, across the country pursuant to active law enforcement investigations. And the NTC only traces crime guns, and every trace must be identified as such by the requester by selecting an appropriate crime code when submitting the trace request. But it further states that the NTC has no ability to determine the successful prosecution of hundreds of thousands of crime gun traces it completes annually, nor does it have any way to link a trace for a specific prosecution for a particular year. And last week, you wrote back to a, a further request that said, uh, the NTC cannot determine the number of prosecutions resulted from completing gun, from crime gun trace requests. So can you tell me what percentage of local law enforcement agencies use the NTC to trace crimes? Um, so with respect to the percentage uh, that are currently using, uh, which I think we should, we should I, I talk to people about trying to increase it. It's free information it's in active half, criminal. Right? It's around 50%, right. give or take. So, so if half of the country's local and state law enforcement isn't using the NTC, uh, then what's the purpose of it other than to create an unlawful registry if there's no way to determine that they're contributing to successful prosecutions? Uh, well, it's, it's because we uh, were asked by, it's over 600 separate times by state and local law enforcement running criminal investigations uh, to, to, to trace firearms that they, local cops, chiefs, sheriffs, associated with the crime. And that is important criminal investigative uh, material. Uh, that we How get do you back know to you don't have that data? Oh, in Highland Park, uh, uh, Illinois, anecdotal. a mass shooter uh, killed seven people. Evidence. In, in, New York, in New York, in New York, on a subway, a mass shooter. Okay. Chair recognizes Mr. Ivey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Duddleback, uh, let me, uh, I'd like to give you a chance to finish your answer. I, I, I found when I was a federal prosecutor that this kind of information was extremely valuable, especially in tracking down the potential connection between a single gun and multiple. There's um, example after example uh, that I've heard, but that the public has heard about how traces are critical in, in dealing with violent crime. In Highland Park, Illinois, uh, a mass murderer killed world. seven Trust people me. celebrating the 4th of July uh, in our country. And an urgent trace was conducted on a federal holiday, turned around within hours, which we can't do for all of them, only the urgent traces uh, because of some of the legal limits we have. 
And they use that information, our local partners and federal partners, to catch that person before he could kill again. In the subway shooting in Brooklyn, another mass incident, we were able to turn around an urgent trace that led to the capture of the killer. In case after case after case, this is something that local detectives, that local uh, gang task forces ask us to do, and we turn around those investigative leads. That's what they're called. They're called leads in criminal cases so that we can help to protect people from being hurt again. Yeah, and I mean, so for example, you might have a gun that's recovered in a shooting. If you use the trace, you can find it maybe was co connected to a previous shooting by a different shooter and get that guy off the street when you wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise, right? Right, there's a Niven tool, which is so important. It basically uh, allows us to, to run a criminal history of a crime gun so that there might be a shooting over here where there's no evidence. But just down the block a couple weeks ago, there's another murder. Uh, or somebody shoots up a stop sign. And on that one, we can connect those two to find out they were fired by the same weapon. Uh, and the local police can then say, oh, we don't have evidence on this one, but we have a license plate reader uh, on that guy who shot up the stop sign. So we now, now we're cooking with gas, right? We've got, a, we've got a lead that we can work on in an active criminal case to try and catch the person. And as I think somebody asked me uh, uh, from the other side of the room, you know, it's important because these people act again many times. And so by interrupting the shooting cycle, we're both holding somebody accountable who hurt or killed somebody, but we're also stopping them from doing it again. So to go back to some of the previous questions you were just asked about um, getting violent offenders off the streets, uh, this, wouldn't this be an extremely valuable tool for doing that? If we wanna get people off the streets who've, sh who've used guns before to actually commit crimes, why wouldn't we want to get as much information as possible to link it to them so we could actually arrest and prosecute them? And while only 50% of the, the agencies participate, uh, I have found, at least anecdotally, that those with the highest rates of violent crime understand and use the tracing and Niven tool very aggressively to try and solve cases. We help our law enforcement partners clear homicides, yeah, and killings. 50 is better than zero, so I, I think it makes sense. And, and 600,000, of course, is better than, that's how many times they asked us individually to trace crime guns just in 2022. Absolutely. So I, I know there's, you know, concern on the other side about a firearms registry, and um, no, just this tracing. isn't that. In fact, I believe the GAO found in 2016 that the out-of-business database uh, was totally compliant. So I, I, I actually don't think that's an issue either. But I think what is clearly an issue is the violence, gun violence on the street, mass shootings in particular. I want to join in commending the, the action groups, Moms Against uh, Gun Violence, or uh, you know, Moms Demand Action and the like, uh, for the work that you're doing makes a huge difference in the communities. I'm old enough to remember Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And, uh, you know, I was, I was in school and so it was still happening it's still that I remember I was actually a, a student prosecutor. You, you had people driving with the wheel in one hand and the beer in the other one, and everybody thought that was fine. That type of social action changed the approach to that and created laws. And I think the work that you're doing is helping to move this in the right direction too. And Lord knows we need it. You know, we've, what I think is 170 plus mass shootings already this year. Um, so we know the gun violence isn't slowing down uh, and the use of these AR-15s and other weapons of, I'll say it, a mass destruction, essentially on our streets, is really devastating communities, and I think we need to take steps to address it. Just one last quick point, I, I you know, I'll join in sort of noting um, that some, I've got colleagues who are actually sponsoring legislation to eliminate the ATF, eliminate the FBI. Uh, one suggested eliminating the, the Department of Justice. So I think, it, you know, if they have their way with that kind of stuff, we won't have any, any means to prosecute not only gun violence at the federal level, but anything. Cartels, gangs, terrorists, we won't be able to prosecute them at the federal level if that kind of approach goes forward. And with that, I, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ivory. Mr. Hunt, you're recognized for five minutes. I'm going to say the choir part out loud because we all know exactly what's going on here. This dude's good. It wasn't a fully automatic machine gun that was banned in 1986. It wasn't the bump stock. It certainly is not the pistol brace. And it is not the AR-15 of which I am the owner of multiple. The left has been chipping away at our Second Amendment rights for decades, and I'm sick of compromising. 
Every time my colleagues on the right compromise on guns, the next thing the left says is, we need to do more. And if the left can't repeal the Second Amendment, then they'll have an unelected bureaucrat like yourself, sir, issue a regulation that will make 40 million Americans felons overnight. That's a fact. Compromising on our fundamental rights is not going to keep our children safe either. Our children should not be prey for homicidal maniacs. And our schools should not be safer, should not be as safe as we have here in Congress. They should be far safer than what we have right now. And if we're, spilling, if we're, if we're willing to spend $113 billion in Ukraine, then we could pay to keep our children safer. So gentlemen in the corner, thank you, sir, for standing in the corner with a gun. And I feel safer by his presence already. And every school should have you present. I was in high school when Columbine happened, and prior to Columbine, we didn't have the level of violence that we're seeing today. In 1986, you can walk into a store anywhere in this country and buy a fully automatic weapon. And being from Texas, acquiring a weapon has always been relatively easy in my lifetime. Were there more or fewer mass shootings across our country when machine guns were available? I think we all know the answer to that. We still weren't having these problems because it's not the guns. It's our core values that have plummeted. The left has been chipping away at our rights for years. They've also been chipping away at our core values. In 1960, 61% of black Americans were married. Today, the number has plummeted to 30%. I am a current member of Congress today because I was raised in a two-parent household. We ate dinner together every single night. We prayed before dinner. We get to the church every single Sunday. My parents were heavily involved in my education. I said the Pledge of Allegiance every single day proudly, and I know every word to God bless the USA by Lee Greenwood. Because of these values, my sister, my brother, and I all graduated from West Point. We all served our country honorably. There's 60 years worth of military service just in my immediate family, which is by definition the American dream. It's because of these values. A recent Wall Street Journal survey came out and it kind of confirmed these decline in our core American values over the course of the past 25 years. The question was, is what values are viewed as, quote, very important? Patriotism. In 1998, 70% Survey felt like patriotism was very important today, 38%. Religion, 62%, very important today, 39%. Having children, 59% in 98, 30% today. Community, 62% in 98, 27% today. The guns haven't changed. The guns have always been available in the United States. Our society has changed, and it's changed drastically, in my opinion, for the worse. So where does that leave us today? There's a reason why crime and gang violence is up. There's a reason why black women are the fastest growing demographics of gun owners in America. You know that, sir. Many of them live in Democrat-run cities with rising crime rates and district attorneys that put criminals ahead of innocent women like we see in New York. And by the way, it's not their husbands or their significant others that are purchasing guns for them. Black women are purchasing guns themselves because we know that Democrats replaced black husbands with Uncle Sam a long time ago. I've been listening to my colleagues on the left talk about guns all day. You have no idea what you're talking about. I fear that if you can't tell me the difference between a man and a woman, <laughs> I am not surprised that you don't know the difference between 556 and 300 blackout. The problem with this administration is always having people that are appointed to run these agencies that aren't fully qualified, that don't understand exactly what's going on and how things work. And if I were running the ATF, I would know a thing about the F in ATF. And by the way, for the record, that's firearms, sir. It's firearms. And with that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair recognizes Mr. Van Drew for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Just before I begin, I didn't even plan to speak on this particular piece, but uh, as I've been in and out, because we had multiple committees today, 
I've heard this constant harangue about Republicans causing gun violence. Now let's really look at this. So I thought, I thought about the big cities. I thought about Chicago, New York City, D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia, just to name a few of them. Is Chicago a Republican city? Is New York City a Republican city? Is Baltimore a Republican city? Is D.C. a Republican town? Is Philadelphia a Republican city? They all have the worst crime rates. Little babies, children, others are killed virtually every week in these places. They have the strictest gun laws you can find anywhere. It is cruel to tell people because you are going to make a stabilizing brace illegal that their little babies are going to be okay, that their children are going to be okay, that their families are going to be okay, because it just isn't true. And Mr. Hunt's exactly right. It has to do with our family structure, our family, our faith, our belief in freedom and patriotism. Our society has fallen apart to a great degree, and this administration has taken every chance possible, every chance to politicize gun violence, to push more and more restrictive measures on legal, on legal and law-abiding gun owners. I'm a gun owner. I go to the range once or twice a week, and the guys that I see there are not bad people. They're sportsmen. They practice. They're very responsible. They know how important it is to be responsible. But you know what I do know? I know the ATF and the pro progressive district attorneys have decided to focus efforts not on punishing the individuals who commit the real crimes, the bad guys, and there are bad guys, but instead use tragedy to push a political agenda to try to waste Second Amendment rights. So my first question to you is, which scenario makes Americans safer? I want everybody to think about this. What makes Americans safer? Turning law-abiding Americans into felons by banning pistol braces, or if we have a weak on crime DA who lets people in and out of jail, some of these people have 20, 30, 40 priors. So is it the violent gun offender that's let out over and over again, or is it a pistol brace that a veteran is using or an older man is using when they shoot? I'd like you to answer that question. At ATF, we focus a huge you percentage of our resources on fighting the kind of violent crime that you have talked I, about. Sir, and it's important I'm respecting and your position, and I'm asked you to answer a simple question. Is it the brace that's a problem, or is it the fact that people who've committed felonies are let out over and over again? Which is it? Is it the brace or the felony? Which is it? When, when is it the brace or the felony? Which is it? When we do an investigation Which is it? Is it the brace violent, or the felony, felon, sir? Felon, a gang member, and we discover that gang member with a brick of crack cocaine and a short-barreled right. rifle. Uh, it, you know, those are both dangerous things. Well, Law-abiding citizens should I, not be targeted. I, guess I agree with you on that, but there are violent people who are using... We are these. letting people out more than we ever have in our history. Crime rates are going up in the cities more than we've ever seen because of the new ultra-left philosophy that we have on criminals. It's a fact. I'm not making this stuff up. So it's an upside-down world in which we live in, and we're turning millions of law-abiding Americans into felons because you made a change about a gun brace. And we don't, that, that's not going to help these ladies. It's cruel to do this to these ladies. And I, I know some of them may think you're going to be the heroes, but you're not. And the assumption by the ATF that these pistol braces make a normal law-abiding person suddenly a violent criminal is bizarre, which leads to my second question. We already know that you're unable to exactly define what an assault weapon is. You said so, we have it on tape. So instead I'll it ask- It's not my role you, to define it. it. I know, I know. If you, you delegate me that it. authority alcohol, by statute- It's alcohol, and tobacco, to and firearms, but we know nothing about it. <laughs> However, have you ever used a firearm with a pistol brace attachment? Uh, I 
the, I've, I've used many different types of firearms. Have you? Uh, I, Did it make I believe, you feel like committing I believe, a crime? I believe I have used a firearm with a stabilizing brace, which w was designed to be shouldered. And man, did it flow through your blood that you wanted Almost to commit a crime? Uh, I, 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 I believe that people I possess Almost firearms and that the firearms aren't things that flow through their bloods. So I don't you recognize Ms. Hageman, Arizona. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's been much discussion in this committee about the issue of regulatory abuse, the growing administrative state, and the role ATF plays in this undermining of our representative government. This has been discussed through the pistol brace rule, among others, but I want to make it clear that this is not a new issue and that the ATF and the entirety of the administrative state continues to engage in illegal lawmaking. Director Dettelbeck, are you familiar with the case Cargill versus Garland? I, I do know that case. I believe that's a pending case in the in the Fifth Circuit. I yes, believe. it's and a I, case that was decided in January of this year, and it relates to challenging ATF's bump stock rule. Now, you have repeatedly stated that the ATF only carries out the laws as passed by Congress, but that isn't true. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, in fact, ruled against the ATF, and I'm just going to cover a few of the findings that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals made. This case was a case, this was initiated by a gun owner in response to the ATF promulgating a regulation to interpret federal law, specifically the National Firearms Act and the Gun Control Act, to define firearm accessories as machine guns, even though Congress had not done so. The regulation was pursued in direct contrast to a position that the ATF held for over a decade, and that's in fact similar to the pistol brace where the ATF actually issued letters to owners of bump stocks and pistol braces saying that they were legal accessories. Yet the ATF eventually changed their mind, but not because Congress issued any new law. It was a new interpretation on your part. In fact, at the court in the Cargill case found that, the, uh, that there had been bills that had been introduced regarding bump stocks but before they could be considered in earnest, the ATF went forward with this rule, quote, short-circuiting the legislative process. The Fifth Circuit further concluded that even if the ATF interpretation of the statute were, were correct, the rule would clash with the rule of lenity because, quote, it purports to allow ATF rather than Congress to set forth the scope of criminal prohibitions. Director Dettelbach, does this situation and the legal questions raised sound familiar to you outside of the scope of the Cargill case? Uh, that the, the rule was promulgated during the prior administration. It is currently in the courts. The circuits are actually split. And right. there's the a, Fifth Circuit there's a, and the Sixth Circuit ruled yesterday, finding again that and, the and, ATF uh, did not have the legal authority and, to and issue the bump stock rule, And correct? another circuit has upheld it, and it is on certiorari before the Supreme Court. I, I understand that. My point is, is that what the ATF did with the bump stock is very similar to what you're attempting to do with the pistol brace rule, isn't it? Uh, those are different situations. They you're are attempting? both applications of Congress's... Uh, well, that's Congress's. not what the court, that's not what the Fifth Circuit found, though, is it? Uh, the, obviously, this is before the courts. Our the Fifth position Circuit has didn't been find is that, in did hundreds they? of pages of public documents. And neither did the Sixth I, Circuit. I will tell you, with respect to bump stocks, I fired a bump stock. Oh, uh, uh, no and I will tell you, the, the, the no, I, it is impossible to simply fire one, one round. Impossible. So it's a pretty scathing indictment of the ATF's attempt to subvert the lawmaking authority of Congress by misinterpreting statutes so that an unelected bureaucrat can essentially alter the underlying statute and apply new criminal prohibitions. This bump stock fight began in 2018, and many of these rules we are examining here began after the 2020 election. The common denominator is the weaponization of the ATF by unelected bureaucrats who are always pushing to expand their power and the scope of federal gun laws to infringe on the Second Amendment. However, your agenda becomes even more dangerous combined with this administration's anti-gun uh, views, which is pushing to infringe on our Constitution and our natural rights. Director, who elected you to expand and rewrite the scope of federal gun laws? Uh, I'm appointed by the President and confirmed you by the Senate. You haven't been elected by anyone, is that right? I do not stand, I'm not a p politician and I don't run for office. Mr. Duddlebuck, is your priority as ATF Director to catch criminals who violate the law or to change the laws to create new criminals? Um, 
we, we use the laws as Congress has passed them to try to protect people from violent crime and catch people who are violating the law, murderers. How is your regulatory agenda accomplishing that goal? Because when Congress passes a law that Congress determines advances public safety, like the National Firearms Act, the law has to be implemented by somebody. It has to be enforced by somebody. Law enforcement officials like myself and the brave men and women who work for me do that. We do that in a variety of different pass, ways. Congress didn't pass a law banning bump stocks, did it? Pom Cong Just answer my question, yes Congress or no. Passed, did Congress pass a law banning bump stocks, Congress yes or no? Congress delegated to ATF rulemaking authority. Did, did, uh, Congress did actually, act. the court held you don't have rulemaking authority. That was the Fifth Circuit time decision. Is up. Yep. And, other, and it's before the courts now. And if whatever the decisions did of Congress, the courts are, we'll, we will Congress, abide by, of course. Did Congress ban pistol braces, uh, yes or no? Congress passed the National Ladies Firearms Times. Act and, and, and said short barreled rifles question. were subject to additional regulations. And Chair recognizes Mr. Ban. Fry. None of it. Thank you, for, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing today. Before I begin, I think it's important to highlight some of the important things that we learned in our prior hearing uh, about the ATF pistol brace rule. Ms. Amy Swear, our senior fellow, legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, testified that the ATF has long sought to undermine the authority of Congress by interpreting or intentionally misinterpreting the law to give itself more power, as Ms. Hageman so eloquently highlighted. We also know that Mr. Alex Bosco, the founder and inventor of the stabilizing brace, that for over 10 years, the ATF did not classify the use of pistol braces as being against any rule of the agency. But now the ATF has suddenly changed its mind without any law passed by Congress, I might add. Thanks to Chairman Jordan's questioning of Mr. Rob Wilcox, director of of policy at every town for gun safety. We also know that gun control advocacy groups have been welcomed into the Biden White House, and the ATF, through a back door, uh, has set these rule changes in motion, much of this being facilitated outside the appropriate rule change petition protocols. President Biden's decision to treat pistols with stabilizing braces as short barrel rifles under the NFA was done without congressional approval and clearly indicates how gun control lobbies in this administration wish to force their restrictive agendas on Americans. I, along with my colleagues, believe that the ATF has overstepped their bounds, that they are usurping congressional authority with its rulemaking and should leave the business of making laws to Congress. I want to ensure that you, Mr. Diddlebach, understand that. Mr. Diddlebach, in your eyes, who has the power to make laws? We'll go back to the schoolhouse rock days. Who has the power to make laws in the United States? Statutes must be passed by Congress of the United States. Excellent. Has Congress explicitly criminalized the use or possession of pistol braces under the Gun Control Act? Congress delegated, have they, they delegated to ATF rulemaking director, authority. Director, we can do this dance all day long, but has Congress explicitly criminalized the use or possession of pistol braces under the Gun Control Act? Yes or no? Congress created the short-barreled rifle as a category that wasn't banned or criminalized, but We're required talking about the additional gun control restrictions. Act. But again, have we, have we defined pistol braces under the Act, and have we criminalized the use or possession of them? No. The answer to it is no. The, the you pistol can't brace that. itself alone is, is not the subject but of again, any rulemaking. That's not my question. It's the short-barreled rifle that's, that's not my created. Question. My question is, has, have we done that? The answer is no, because you can't point to it. You can't point to a statute that has that. Has Congress explicitly authorized the regulation of pistol braces under the National Firearms Act? Uh, our positions, which are set forth in legal briefs, uh, say that we, we believe we are acting within our regulatory authority as delegated by Congress on short-barreled rifles. Correct. So 10 years ago when this came forward, and the ATF sanctioned the creation of and use of pistol braces, those, those have been outlined pretty uh, extensively. That was an individual product. The way it works is people submit an individual product. Many different products beyond that have been produced uh, and used since that time. In reliance on ATF's guidance, okay. right? You can't have one thing classified and then say you're relying on it and you change the product and say, and that's what was going on. People were saying that, that things had been approved by ATF that had never even been presented to ATF. Director, how many pistol braces are owned by American citizens? Um, so uh, while so we don't regulate the brace itself, so I don't know, but the estimates in the rule 
uh, name a number that is far lower than the number that I hear others saying. And, there, and one what of the you, numbers... What would, you, what would you say that uh, in I, your I, estimates? I would have to look at the rule, but I, I think it's in the rule it has a, an impact estimation, and it's... It, it's, it's I, be, I don't want to misstate it. I believe it's several million, but I'm not sure. Several million. Okay, so we can at least agree several million, according to the agency. That You'd have to check the, uh, the record fine, on that. We can at least stipulate to that. With implementation of this rule, obviously we've gone through that. You either have to surrender your weapon, you have to disassemble it, you have to get destroy it, turn it in, or what happens? You're no, you, subject to criminal penalties. Have, Is that correct? So you have to either, um, by the way, we've waived all taxes on this during the period of time. There's no taxes. We've, but, so, but again, so, but we, you can either disassemble the brace from the weapon. The weapon still works as the way you bought the weapon. So, but, but hold on, back up. I'm going to reclaim my time for a second. So the agency for 10 years has, has allowed this to, to come into being, has sanctioned the existence of and the implementation of and the furtherance of these pistol braces into the marketplace. And now, with at least several million, as you stipulated to, now they want to clamp down on that. And my problem is I hear the snickering and the sneers from the crowd at some points today, and they might think it's funny, but I'm concerned about average everyday Americans who aren't aware of this rule, who are now going to be turned into felons, subject to up to a $250,000 fine. I think it's ridiculous that we're even here, Director. And I think the mission of the ATF is not in compliance with what you're actually doing with this rule. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Fry. Uh, Chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Director, I want to remind you you're under oath. It, can you tell me, um, are there any other rules coming down the pipe in the ATF that we need to warn the American consumers that they may be made uh, felons? Uh, so there is a process for rulemaking uh, that's outlined under the APA, and ATF works through and honors that process. Uh, and so we, we consider matters, and when it comes time, we actually publish a public notice of the intent to to, to issue a rule, that's the way we speak about whether we uh, are seeking to enact a rule. So why now? I mean, the pistol brace has been around for over a decade. Why now? So if, you, if one reviews the, the notice of proposed rulemaking, there is a very detailed public, this is a transparent process. That's the good thing about the APA and notice and comment rulemaking. We talk about the, the history of the individual devices that were presented, some inconsistency, which, which, which which is important to say. Uh, and then the necessity to try and clarify for people who want to follow the law, which things, which factors are going to make things into uh, short-barreled rifles. So I, I just, I'm curious, are there, is there anything coming down the pot we need to, to warn our gun owners about, our American consumers, our Second uh, Amendment folks? Uh, again, when we want, when, with the APA provides for a process, and when, it's, when, the, when there's rulemaking, that we publish a notice of, of, of proposed rulemaking, and that then gives the public time to submit comments. We, and we get comments, and we read and review and, and, and take into account those comments at that point. Mr. Drader, can you, not, can you define an assault weapon for me? Uh, again, um, if Congress chooses to take up legislation involving assault weapons, I believe Congress would have two choices. Either Congress itself could write the definition of what an assault weapon is, as happened in Congress in 1994, as happened, I think, in, in seven or eight or nine or ten different state legislatures who have different definitions, by the way. Okay, or so Congress could delegate to ATF. Which we probably won't do as long <laughs> well, as... Well, I, I, from the tone sure. of some of the yeah, I, questions... I, 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 I hope we so, never did it. So but, why, but, was it, why is it... With, I, I got limited time. Why, would, when you put a pistol brace on it, is it... We have so many people define it then as an assault weapon, and we haven't defined it. Um, a pistol brace... Uh, uh, when it's added to the weapon. With, the, with, the, with certain types of pistols, not all, and not all types of braces, can form a short-barreled rifle, which is, Congress said an inch number, right? A, a number of inches for the barrel, and, and then it has to be, according to Congress, designed or intended to be shouldered, uh, and that's what the rule seeks to provide clarification on so we can have a consistent set of objective features of the firearm. Well, let me say real quick, I, I, I went to buy a shotgun a few months ago, and my time expired. I mean, it, the background check, I finally just, it expired, and they called me and said, you can come on and get it. So it's not so easy in Alabama to get a gun. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield the remainder of my time to you, sir. Uh, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Mr. Dettelbach, the, the, the pistol brace is an accessory, right? 
uh, regulate alone firearms. without attached to anything. The pistol brace uh, is not something that we right. regulate. But when it's attached to um, pistol, it can become a short barreled rifle and then, then is subject under the National Firearms Act. That's what you're saying. Depending on the features of both the pistol Understand. and the brace. And there are some, the forearm, everybody talks about forearm braces. True forearm braces that are not designed and intended to be shouldered would not, uh, would be Got it. classified Got it. and not covered. And the bump stock's an accessory, right? Uh, uh, the bump stock is uh, a conversion device. Uh, I believe, so, so I want to check, our position mm -hmm. on that is in briefs, but that's a different provision of the well, when, act, that's a provision. When the bump stock gets added to a firearm and that's now subject to the NFA. And so, so the, the NFA problem. specifically says that items which can be used to convert something to a fully automatic weapon are covered by the NFA. So that's the, those are the words Congress used. They didn't right. use the word accessory, they then, used things that And you guys be, said the bump stock fits that definition and it's subject to the NFA, right? Uh, correct. The bump stock then and that's been was challenged in court, right? It's currently before the courts, or it's a split in the different courts. Well, it's in the courts. I'm just looking at the one that came out yesterday, Sixth Circuit, one you're familiar with, Sixth Circuit. Right. right. The Sixth Circuit, I think, right. ruled yesterday. Uh, a panel of the Sixth Circuit. There's a prior on bank, uh, and I haven't just had. Let a me read. To let me read, and just tell me if you think. The, the, here's what the court said: the viability of competing interpretations is exemplified not only by the myriad and conflicting judicial opinions on the issue but also by the ATF's own flip-flop in its position. And that's what I think concerns Americans. As you guys told us all one thing, told the country one thing on the bump stock, and then you change. You told the country all one thing on pistol braces, and then you change, and that's the conflict. And on this situation, bump stocks, I don't know how many Americans had that, but my guess is not near as many have had the brace. Now we're talking about a situation that I, I doubt you've ever been in before where you're gonna make a rule that's gonna impact millions and millions of Americans, and that's the problem. That's the concern. That's why you're here talking to us today. Lots of Americans have, that's why there are cases all over the country, because you said one thing and you flip-flop. Not my words, the Sixth Circuit, their words. That's the problem. Of course, I understand the legal record, and I haven't read the opinion, and I will. Uh, with respect to what happened in the prior administration when that rule was issued, of course, I wasn't there. I don't know the details, we covered it here. but our legal position is spelled out publicly as to what the, the rule that was issued in the prior administration said. I think the, uh, I think the, I'll yield back to you, the chairman, your function as chairman. I'll yield back to you to close it out. That concludes the hearing for today. We thank our witness for appearing before the committee. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days to, sit adi to submit additional written questions for the witness or additional materials for the record. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned. All right, y'all, that is that. That's a wrap. Thank you for joining me for this. I will tell you that uh, I got another video coming out today with one of the worst bills ever submitted. If you're a Second Amendment uh, person, you happen to take some medications, they're coming for you. So look for that here shortly. I'm going to release it once I wrap this up. Guys and gals, thanks for your time, thanks for your efforts, thanks for your love. Until we see each other again, be safe, stay vigilant, carry a gun to keep you, your friends, your family, your community safe. Love each and every single one of you. Thanks for joining me on another, uh, that's a three hour and 36 uh, uh, live stream. Wasn't as bad as 15, but can't do it without you. Take care. <laughs>